thank you, thank you, Tony, and thank you, Kirby, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Spud Woodward, uh, governor's appointee from the state of Georgia and chair of uh, the Atlantic Menhaden Management Board. I'm going to call our October 19th, 2021 meeting to order. Unfortunately, uh, we're once again doing this virtually, which has uh, been a test of all of our patients. I know, and uh, hopefully there's a bright light on the horizon and uh, maybe this will be the last time we have to do this uh, in a virtual format. So I'll do my best to keep us moving. Um, before we um, uh, have approval of the agenda, I just wanna make a couple of comments on it in terms of in the interest of hopefully keeping things flowing smoothly this afternoon we have until 5 15 uh, allocated for this meeting uh, we've got a couple of uh of agenda items uh, both of which uh, can consume a vast amount of time so what i'd like to do on our on our number four agenda item is is hopefully limit that discussion uh to about 210 to 15. this will be the third time that we've actually seen information and the second time we've had some discussion in fact uh, there's about 11 pages in our proceedings from our last meeting where we discussed this agenda item so uh, i certainly don't want to constrain the discussion but uh, hopefully we can move forward uh, i know uh, the dc and the erp work group would certainly like for us to make a decision at this meeting uh, if we just can't reach consensus or something close to it uh, we can certainly move this forward to the next meeting but uh, i'd like i'd like for us to do that if possible um, after a break we'll go into uh, a progress update on the development of draft addendum one to amendment three uh, we've got a couple of hours allocated for that uh, what we really want to do with this is is we're going to present an overview of it go through each item uh, then take some some general questions about uh, the overview and then sort of work our way back to the beginning and start dealing with each uh, each item uh, individually because there's a series of questions. Unfortunately, you didn't get this uh, uh, until last week. Uh, I wish everybody had a little more time, but we will certainly give it uh, the amount of diligence that we need. So uh, with all that said, are there any recommendations for modifications uh, of the agenda? If so, please raise your hand. I see no hands, bud. All right, thank you. Any objection to the agenda as presented? I see no hands. All right, we'll consider the agenda adopted by unanimous consent. Uh, next item will be approval of the proceedings from our August 2021 meeting. I, know I pointed out at least one thing to Kirby that was a, a minor, minor change, but uh, are there any uh, modifications, edits, corrections to the proceedings that need to be made a matter of record? I see no hands. All right. Are there any objections to accepting the proceedings as uh, presented in the briefing materials? I see no hands. All right. We will consider uh, the proceedings adopted by unanimous consent. All right. This is the time on the agenda for public comment. I think Kirby, we have at least one person who would like to make comment. Is that correct? Yes, that's my understanding. We have uh, Tom Lilly who's indicated he wants to provide public comment. All right, Mr. Lilly. Uh, and again, just to remind you, this is an opportunity for comment for things that are not on the agenda for this meeting. And um, we were pretty busy, so I'll, uh, I'll certainly allow you three minutes uh, for comment. And we've got a uh, timekeeper up there on the screen. So uh, yeah, we'll right. proceed. But just really quick, I just want to let you know that you have three folks with their hands raised, um, Tom, Phil Zalzek, and Cap Captain Robert Newbury. Okay, all right, well, we will take them in order then. All right, go ahead, Mr. Lilly. All right, board members, will you please start the process today to make sure the Menhaden schools coming into the bay in the spring and summer to feed our striped bass spawning stock and ospreys are protected from the eight to 10 fursainers that target them? That's the question. That's the time of year when our spawning straight bass are in the bay. They need the high energy of Menhaden for the extra demands of spawning. As you know, no other, any other prey is a poor substitute. That these fish, according to Chesapeake Bay Foundation and Director Beal, are in poor condition, malnourished, 
Van Hayden and their diet has declined from 70% to 8%. You should know that the Maryland Juvenile uh, Survey counts are the lowest they've been in 75 years. The Bay Cap does nothing, nothing to protect this vital forage. It operates, if at all, after all that all the damage is done. This is a discontinuing and worsening spawn situation. Failure is harming millions of people in each of your states. It's not just Maryland's problem. Ask yourself this. Am I standing by while one or two delegates are blocking what you know and what I believe every person in Maryland that values Chesapeake Bay knows, knows that this that action needs to be taken to solve this problem right now. Just going along for the last 15 years has gotten Chesapeake Bay in the shape it's in right now. Uh, both the spring summer menhaden and at least 50,000 metric tons of forage are now being taken directly from the bay's food chain. This can be protected by moving the persane fishing into the U.S. Atlantic just as every state but Virginia has done. If you do this, the three owners of the Persane boats in Virginia will still be getting 150,000 metric tons of free menhaden. They will be getting three times as much menhaden as all the other fishermen in all the other Atlantic states combined. If the board acted, acts at this meeting to start a process to protect the flow of forage into Chesapeake Bay, and protect the forage base that that creates. This day, Tuesday, October 19th, will go down as a very good day for Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. I appreciate you keeping it uh, within the time. And next up, um, Bill Zelsack, go ahead. Uh, can you hear me, Chairman? I've got you loud and clear. All right, Chairman Woodman, I just have one question in support of what Tom Milley just said. What are you going to do about the destruction of the Chesapeake Bay marine environment today, not five to 10 years from now? I see no science which supports removing over 26% of the Atlantic coast total allowable catch of Atlantic Menhaden from the Virginia portion of the Chesapeake Bay. I've seen no empirical data indicating a vibrant commercial harvest of key predators of Atlantic menhaden in the Chesapeake Bay, such as striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish. I have read commission science that says there's not enough Atlantic menhaden on the Atlantic coast to ensure the survivability of key, key predator fish, such as striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish. I have read the letter from Dr. Brian Watts from William & Mary to the governor of Virginia, stating that there are not enough Atlantic menhaden in the menstain stem of the Chesapeake Bay to feed the osprey. The conclusion was based on 50 years of research. I've seen the data documenting the steady, the steady decline in commercial catch of striped bass, bluefish, and weak fish in the Chesapeake Bay is documented by Maryland, Virginia, and the Potomac River Fisheries Commission. I've seen data documenting the steady decline in commercial fishermen in both Virginia and Maryland as documented by the Maryland Department of Natural Resources and the, Mar the Virginia Marine Resources Commission. You, as chairman, are responsible for leading the board and focusing on strategic matters. Your first order of business is to end the destruction of the Chesapeake Bay marine environment. Are you gonna put forth a motion to end reduction fishing in the Virginia waters as other states have done and start a discussion based on science and empirical data, yes or no? The benefits where this has occurred have been enormous. Commissioner Wood Woodward, I yield my remaining time for a response from you. Thank you, Mr. Zelsack. Uh, however, I, I guess my response would be that this is a public comment period, certainly not a question and answer session. So I will refrain from any sort of response. I do appreciate your passion and your commitment to this issue. And I assure the board takes very seriously the issue of the bay. And men hate within it. So, uh, our next uh, commenter is Captain Robert Newberry. Yes, yeah, Spud, can you hear me? I got you. Got you, buddy. All right. Um, Captain Robert Newberry, Chairman of Delmarva Fisheries here in Maryland. Um, 
So I've been hearing there's been a lot of doom and gloom talked about the Chesapeake Bay. Um, we represent the Menhaden Fishermen, which is a stationary fishery here in the state of Maryland. We do not hunt and chase. A few do gill net, but the majority of it are pound netters. And uh, over the past several years, yes, our, our catch, we've had to leave it a little bit on the table, but that's because our market has basically been uh, uh, kind of sidelined for us. You know, the majority of our fish were going to the New England states, and now with this episodic event going on up in Maine, um, it's really hard, hurt our market. I would certainly hope that this commission would also take a look at the financial side that is adversely affecting uh, my Menhaden fishermen. And to comment on the, uh, the health of the Chesapeake Bay, uh, I also run a charter boat and uh, represent many people in the charter boat industry. And we've had a good fishing season this year in the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, once again, it's it's gotten better, even with the pandemic, uh, you know, money-wise for the charter fishing, but the, the health of the fish seems to be in a good shape. Uh, we understand that there is a low amount of, of uh, young of the year index this year, but that could be because of the, the change in the climate that we're experiencing right now, and we will address that with the department. But to hang it on the hat of saying that the Ben Hayden fishery in Virginia is affecting and adversely affecting the Chesapeake Bay. Um, I've got to firmly and very honestly disagree with that because it does not affect my Menhaden fishermen in any shape, form, or manner. There are days that they catch them and there are days that they don't catch them because they are not a hunt and chase fishery. But knowing the upper bay and the Chesapeake Bay like I do, I am seeing loads and loads of fresh year class and two year class Menhaden. And as far as the poor ospreys, we've got more ospreys. And just for example, on my farm, we've got eight nesting pairs and we picked up two more eagles this year. So, I mean, I, I just can't see that there's all this, you know, doom and gloom about the Chesapeake Bay. I know that the commission will move forward in a, in a good move to address the problems, but everything in the science we're seeing is that it is a sustainable fishery. And I think blaming the state of Virginia for decimating the Chesapeake Bay and not addressing the real problem with pollution that we have, specifically in the Upper Bay, is the main issue. And I thank you very much for letting me comment, and uh, you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Newberry. We appreciate it. All right. Uh, Tony, Kirby, anybody else in the queue? Public comment? That's it. It's fun. All right. All right. I appreciate Thanks, everybody, for the comments, and thanks for keeping within your allotted time. I do appreciate it. Our next agenda item is um, providing guidance to the technical committee and ecological reference point working group on priorities for completing the next benchmark stock assessment. As I mentioned earlier, we had an opportunity to look a lot of background material. We've had some pretty robust discussions about it. And, and obviously this is a challenging thing for the board um, to come up with, you know, a consensus opinion uh, we all want to advance ecosystem-based management. We certainly want to maintain our forward progress on uh, the use of ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden, um, but we all also have to uh, be cautious to not let our ambitions overwhelm our reality. And uh, I know uh, Dr. Sierra has got a presentation for us that I think maybe will help us focus our discussions today uh, so that we can give guidance back to the the key student working group, uh, the guidance they need so that they can move forward. So with that, uh, Matt, are you ready to go? Yeah, I think so. Can you guys hear me? I got you loud and clear. All right. All right thank, thank you. you. Um, so uh, my name is Matt. Um, I'm a scientist for the Maine Department of Marine Resources, and I'm also the chair of the Ecological uh, uh, Reference Point Working Group. And so next slide, please. All right. So to get this to get this ball rolling, um, as you guys know, um, in our uh, peer review document as well as uh, in the assessment document itself, um, there was a, a research recommendation to develop a spatially explicit model. Um, and back in two thousand, you know, in twenty one in the winter, um, you guys asked us, uh, you know, to really uh, provide further details, um, including. You know, the data needs, timeline for development and implementation, you know, as well as whether or not a spatial model will help resolve some of those vexing questions that you guys have on regional based management and Chesapeake Bay management questions. Next slide. 
So we came back and gave you, you know, a preliminary list of potential spatial approaches um, that covered like a lot, you know, a wide range of spatial complexity and data needs um, with different levels of sort of management support to, to give you guys, you know, an idea of what could be provided um, as far as to support your management. Um, I will say that, you know, all of these data needs and model considerations and everything that we put out you know, is subject to our current understanding of feasibility based on what we know currently. And this can be subject to change. Um, so the approach or probably the, the best approach to help you guys make informed decisions is kind of going to depend on your goals, you know, as well as the data and funding that goes along with it. Next slide. So again, as you guys remember from the memo, as well as some of the other presentations, we, we've got a whole range here, um, you know, from core spatial uh, models uh, with minimal data requirements to much more fine scale, um, you know, needing a lot more information on diets and that kind of information. And there's a range of approaches um, to go through that. And as you go from coarser to more fine scale, you know, there's that potential for, you know, increased cost as well as increased time involved for getting this kind of stuff done. Next slide. So getting an idea of your objective is gonna help us move forward um, with whatever you know, is the most appropriate approach that's ultimately you know, going to be the most useful for you guys. Um, and you know, so to get right down to it, I'm gonna ask you guys a series of questions. I'm going to pause after each question uh, for, for you guys to discuss um, and so that we can get a better handle on what your goals and objectives really are um, and so that we can move forward with the best tool that's going to be you know useful for you guys for making decisions. Next slide. Okay. Question number one. Um, are you guys interested in a spatially explicit model for men? At any time, any scale, any time frame, you know, is anybody really opposed to having a spatially explicit model for them? And I'll let you guys discuss that for a minute. Okay. All right. We've got a question posed to the board. Uh, so I will open it up for responses to this question. So uh, if you'll raise your hand, Tony will be monitoring the hands and I'll be doing my best to make sure I get them in the proper order. I'm waiting for that onslaught of hands to come to us, bud. All right, we'll start with Connor McManus. <laughs> He's a All right, go ahead, Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess, put I simply put, um, I, the, I, I would be interested in such an effort. I see there's value in better capturing the dynamics for the stock in doing so. Um, with, without turning it too much of into a, another question, I suppose it comes down to just priorities and um, at the in doing so at the expense of what other tasks we may have coming up, whether it's future benchmarks, future um, um, reference point work group work on alternative models revisiting ones that have been looked at in the past. So in simple uh, terms, yes, but um, I guess it would depend on the priorities. Yeah, we've got yeah. other questions to go through that to hopefully help nail some of that other stuff down. But like, just as a base level question, is anybody really opposed to doing a spatially explicit model for many? Great, thanks, Matt. So I guess my answer would be yes. Um, All right. Two more. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, Lynn Fakely and Rob LaFrance. Uh, who is the first one? Uh, Lynn Fakely. Okay. All right, go ahead, Lynn, and then Rob, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Matt. And hopefully we'll be able to get through. I know we want to do this quickly. Um, so I think in my mind, the answer is um, I certainly would not be um, opposed to spatial model, but I guess what I'd like for you to maybe help us understand is I know since the benchmark, you know, the the 
the scientists have been talking about um, adding seasonality and some spatial components to the model um, to better refine the estimates, especially in relation to the overlap of Manhattan with Atlantic herring. So I guess in my mind, I'm trying to understand what, so if, if you guys had your head and you wanted to keep this thing on schedule, in other words, not delay the benchmark, what kind of spatial components, spatial and seasonality would you be able to add? And what sort of increased resolution would that give us? I think that would probably be informed by my next series of questions after after we get this sort of thing out of the way. Um, you know, we'll, we can talk a little bit more about what we're what we're planning on and what we're thinking about. Um, you know, as far as you know, um, what where we see the direction needs to go. You're you're correct. We're definitely considering seasonality effects, um, but whether or not that translated into spatial resolution is something that that we certainly can discuss. Um, but but for now, I think I want to focus everyone in on, you know, kind of a yes or no question. Is there anyone really opposed to pursuing a spatially explicit model? Um, and if not, then we can move on. And, you know, if if you guys don't, if you guys don't want to do this, we can end the presentation and I can go have a slice of pizza. Um, sure. But but, you know, for for right for right now, it, it's really, you know, this particular question we will get into how much if, if you guys do want a spatially explicit model. We can get into the kind of trade-offs of what that will be um, in our next couple of questions. All right, maybe I sense? can help uh, uh, put us back on track with this. Uh, before I call on you, Rob, uh, does anyone on the board have serious reservations or opposition to moving forward with some level of spatially explicit modeling? If so, raise your hand and uh, express your concerns. Uh, if not, then we will assume that at some some level of spatially explicit modeling integrated into the current approach is the is the will of the board. So, so Rob, you had your hand up, so go ahead. I'll call on you. But after that, if, you know, I'll be looking for raised hands from those who who have concerns about. You know, using some sort of spatially explicit component. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think we're going to ask Matt not to have pizza and continue his work and move forward here. That's all I guess I wanted to say. I, I just think it's really important to get the spatially explicit model so we understand the dynamics of this fishery, certainly with regard to where it moves given climate change. So thank you. Thank you, Rob. All right, Tony, got any hands? I have no hands. Okay. I think that answered your question, Matt. So let's move on. Excellent. Uh, yeah, um, this is the problem with actually working from home when you're right next to your refrigerator. Uh, <laughs> um, so the next slide, please. This one's a little bit more of a beefier question. So, are you guys willing to delay the next benchmark in order to explore a spatially explicit model for that? So to give you to give you guys a clue, our next benchmark is in 2025. Before that, we're doing an update um, of the single species model in 2022. We will start doing a benchmark right after that in 2023. Um, so the 2025 benchmark for both the ERP model as well as the single species model lines up pretty well with a lot of the other species in the ERP model. And so the question for you guys, you know, is do you want to delay that next benchmark in 2025? How long will depend on the, the answer to the next few questions. Um, but it, but do you want to delay that model, um, that benchmark assessment in order to move forward with spatially explicit stuff? So before you answer that question, can we go to the next slide? So if you're if you're not willing um, to delay the next benchmark, um, we will go ahead with a 2025 benchmark as we had planned, um, and we will consider spatially explicit stuff after that. As I alluded to earlier, we have some other things in the in the assessment model that we need to deal with. In particular, like Lynn brought up, um, you know the the issue of of 
uh, seasonality, particularly with Atlantic, men, uh, Atlantic herring consumption, um, and some other aspects that we'd like to take a closer look at before we bounce it off the peer review. Um, if the answer is yes to this question, then we're going to postpone this 2025 uh, benchmark assessment. Um, we have further questions that we're going to answer, uh, ask you guys um, to help guide us in that process um, so that we can try to figure out what's the best approach, you know, to get you the information. That you need. And so I'm going to stop here and I'm going to let you guys have a discussion about whether or not you're willing to delay the next benchmark. How long that delay will be will be dependent on the answers that you have to the next few questions. All right. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I've just got a question, maybe that will help the board. Um, if we do not delay and we go forward, we will be continuing to advance the use of ecological reference points for Atlantic Menhaden by refining the model and the data inputs um, that we're using. Is that, is that a reasonable statement to say? That is. We have, we have, we still, as you guys know, we still have a lot of work to do, um, in particular with that spatial issue with Atlantic herring, but for some other things as well. Um, we have plenty of work for the next benchmark, um, you know, in addition to considering spatially explicit stuff, you know, to begin with. And so that's the reason um, that it's going to take us almost two years in the next benchmark. You got to remember, we're updating a single species model with all the tweaks and bells and whistles that go with that. But also, um, you know, we, we have to redo that ERP model. Um, and so that, that will be, that will be an endeavor and it, it will, it will mean that we will have to refine some of our estimates. All right. Thank you. All right. So what I'd like now is I'd like to hear from board members who are in favor of postponing the, uh, 2025 benchmark, uh, in the interest of incorporating spatially explicit modeling elements. So if, if you feel strongly that that's the right course of action, I'd ask that you raise your hand and uh, explain your position. Any hands, Tony? Sorry about that. Uh, I have no hands at this time. Oh, wait, hey, I have hands. Sorry, Tom Fody, and then followed by Connor. All right, go ahead, Tom. Now, I just have a question. Why, if we po if we did not do the single species um, turnkey, would that give us more time to get the 2025 in without running over if we did spatial planning? I don't know the answer. Yeah, I don't know. Go ahead, Matt. It will, it will depend on your answer to the next few questions, largely, um, depending on how complicated of a model and a framework you want. Um, the answer is possibly, but you also need to remember that the terminal year for that, that last benchmark was 2017. Um, so it's getting old. And um, particularly for you guys to be making management decisions like quotas. So um, I think, you know, I would have to go back to the, the ERP and probably the TC to get a more definitive answer on that question. Um, but I'll allow you guys to cogitate a little bit on that particular issue. 2017 is quite a long way, um, you know, prior, you know, before getting an update of a single species. And in general, depending on the choices that you have um, in front of you, you know, it might be a while even, even with um, not doing a single species. But so there's a lot of work involved, depending on your choices in the next question. Does that hopefully answer your question, Tom? As best as you can, I guess. <laughs> yeah, sorry. But I, mean, the, and, I mean, I can't speak, I can't speak for the teaching. Um, and I, we would have to, we would have to ask, them. but, you know, unless there's a Katie Drew somewhere running around who, or, or a Sarah who would like to answer that question off the top of their head. I'll, uh, this is Sarah. I'll, I'll just chime in if I may, Spud. Certainly go right ahead, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to note that the, in the timelines we laid out in the memo, which, um, it may have been a while since folks 
looked at that with a fine tooth comb, but the, the timelines for development for a lot of these facial approaches were looking at something in the range of five to seven years. And I will note that we only have, um, well, a, a little bit over three years to go uh, between now and 2025, I guess four if you push it to the end of 2025. So based on the timelines that we uh, worked with with the ERP, I don't think a, a 2025 deadline uh, was, was feasible. Uh, we could get maybe closer to that, but even if there was less um, work on the single species side, there's a lot of development that would be needed uh, for ERP based on their last assessment of timelines, which again, caveat that those are subject to change. So with that in mind, Tom, um, I think, you know, the crux is it's like the, not doing a single species assessment only by to about a year. Thank you. Off that five percent. All right, uh, Connor, over here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Matt, just one real quick question first. Um, and sorry if you had said this and I missed it. Um, for if, if the answer were no, um, is the plan for the the benchmark to be the both the BAM and the uh, ecological reference point working group to go concurrently to evaluate the same suite of models for the ecosystem component that was done previously? Or are we just speaking to the single species? Nope, we're speaking about both the ERP models and um, the uh, single species band models. So both models for the benchmark. Excellent, thank you. Um, I guess um, this is to help the conversation. I guess my preference would be uh, to, to not delay the 2025 benchmark. Um, I think as we've talked about in a number of meetings now, we've seen changes in the dynamics of the stock in the last several few years that are included in our inference for the species that are, I think are important to get updated information on as fast as possible. Um, as well as I'd like to take another evaluation um, as time permits for the uh, ERP working group model suite. And again, take a look at some of the things we've learned about the seasonality and such um, for the EWE model since our last meeting or since, since it was uh, brought forth to the board a couple of years ago, and then further, again, take another look at some of the models that we're using to base our ecological reference point um, decisions on. So uh, with that, I would suggest, uh, um, I, I, from my perspective, it would be um, not, uh, to not delay the assessment would be the best approach. Thanks. Thank you, Tucker. Uh, any other hands, Tony? Nope. Okay, Matt, I think you have an answer to that question. It's pretty definitive. Yeah, excellent. Um, so just, and also just to remind you guys that it's not like we're going to stop working on spatial issues. Um, I mean, we're going to, we're going to go through this next benchmark, but we're hoping to work on more spatial issues for the following benchmark. So it, it's not like this is going away forever. Ever, you guys will you guys will see it again. Um, so with that kind of consensus sort of in mind, um, we can move to the next question. The next slide, please. And you know, given given your your consensus so far, um, you know, the the next couple of questions aren't really critical, um, but there's something for you guys to to sort of keep in the back of your mind. Um, and in particular, to sort of cogitate on as we go through this benchmark and as we set up for the next benchmark, right? Um, sort of the, the, the first, you know, of those, you know, this question is, you know, do you want Chesapeake Bay specific um, information to take uh, precedent or do you want a coarse spatial model that will include the Chesapeake Bay? Um, and the pros and cons of this type of an approach are, you know, if we do something just for the Chesapeake Bay, um, you know, a, a sort of simplified Chesapeake Bay approach um, might be done a little bit more quickly than something that's more, you know, regionally based. Um, and, you know, incorporating some of those host-wide spatial dynamics 
you know, in and of itself is a reasonable approach for, for our ERP work just to begin with. Um, but getting at sort of an idea of whether or not you guys are, are interested in doing something that's just for the Chesapeake Bay versus the Chesapeake Bay and the region wide would give us a better idea about timelines, for example. Um, and again, this is a really critical, um, given your consensus on the last question. So I'll shut up now and let you guys talk. Yeah, a, a clarifying question on that. You're, uh, Matt, you, you were referring to what would be the next step after the uh, 2025 benchmark. Or where Correct. would we go next in terms of yep. priorities? Right. Okay. And again, you guys don't have you guys don't have to come to consensus about this now, considering your answer to the last question. Right. But it is something to keep in the back of your mind and for maybe for you guys to discuss a little bit. Well, and also I think it's very helpful because you know one of the things that we continue to struggle with is we, we need to be able to feed ecosystem based management with uh, a lot of data and you know uh, nobody's just giving us money willy nilly. And, you know, if, if we believe that some sort of Chesapeake Bay focused approach is necessary, I think that may help, um, us focus funding requests and, and maybe, uh, use of existing funds. So with that, I will, um, I will open the floor to those who would like to comment in response to this. Uh, you have Lynn Fagley followed by Emerson Hasbrook. All right, go ahead, Lynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. You actually read my mind and asked the exact clarifying question that I was going to. Um, be, so now we know we're talking this question refers to what will happen after the benchmark. Um, and I think a lot of that really depends on what sort of data gathering programs you know, we can muster um, in the interim. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And, and thank you for being a, a depth mind reader. Yeah. You're welcome. All right, go ahead, Emerson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? I got you, loud and clear. Yeah, um, from my perspective, I think it's a little premature to ask this question and then to answer this question. Um, I would rather revisit this question once we know what the next benchmark assessment shows. Um, you know, I don't want to uh, provide some direction for something that's not going to happen for maybe two or three years from now. And then when we get there, we've got a different perspective on things. So um, I, I think it's too premature to answer this question. Thank you. I appreciate that, Emerson, and I think this is certainly not intended to be a binding recommendation from the board, uh, more, more than just a, a sense of the direction that the board would like our scientific advisors to go. Is that is that a correct way of phrasing that, Matt? Yeah, with the, with the caveat is, depending on your answer to the next question um, along those lines is, you know, the next bench, you know, the benchmark after this one, it, it seems like it's a long time away, right? Um, except if you've got to somehow get funding for surveys and get them completed by the next, by the benchmark after next, then you start talking about, you know, that, that does become important. Um, and so as we, as we move through this next question, um, you know, we can, we can sort of get an idea of like, it might be it, it might take getting a, a survey off the ground for example in order to get you the if you're interested in the chesapeake bay um you know then a, a survey may may be required and therefore we will need to start that well before the benchmark after that right so hopefully that can you know if you want this kind of stuff then we need to start thinking thinking about it now and finding the money Right. If you're going to build a house, you got to have materials. So, uh, any, any hands uh, up right now, Tony? If not, I think maybe we would move to the next slide to help inform this discussion. All of a sudden, we got a bunch of hands. Uh, Steve Bowman, followed by Allison Colden, Max Appleman, and Emerson. I think your hand might be left over from before. Yep, it was. So, Steve, Allison, Max. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Good afternoon, Mr. 
Chairman. Um, as you well know, I've many times gone on record hoping for some more definitive information that we could glean from the Chesapeake Bay. And this question uh, hits right to the point. I was going to wait to some of my uh, very informed colleagues answered first, but I think it would be a disservice and not be in keeping with the consistency that I've always advocated for, and that is the need to understand the dynamic of what's going on in the Chesapeake Bay. Um, the, the rest of the, the aspects of the modeling, of course, can feed with, with it, but I really, honestly, you know, we, we've, we've heard uh, everything from what's so important about the Bay, and it would really, really be from, at least from our perspective, as we are now responsible at the Marine Resources Commission for managing the, uh, the Menhaden fishery um, in the Chesapeake Bay for us to have the best science that we possibly can. And I think that this is a step forward in that direction. So I would certainly be in support of it. All right, thanks, Steve. All right, uh, Allison, go ahead. I didn't do that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm just wondering if there are some opportunities. I know the memo included a couple of um, interim options or indicator index type of options. And I'm just sort of wondering, in addition to identifying and getting additional surveys and data collection on the ground, are there other efforts that we could possibly dual track um, maybe at the state level in the interim while the benchmark is being developed? I, I agree that it's important for that to move forward on time. I share Matt's concerns about the terminal year of the previous assessment and being too far behind the eight ball there. But with respect to either like ecosystem indicators or the aerial survey, or, you know, I think that there's a, an assessment that was funded for um, Chesapeake Bay specifically that has not moved forward. Would you recommend um, any of those options that could possibly be dual tracked um, so that we could be ready? with some other options at the state level before or soon after the next benchmark. Go ahead, Matt, you can respond to that, or, or Sarah, whoever's most comfortable doing it. We can, uh, we can, we can certainly, we, as we go through the next benchmark, we certainly will talk about this, these types of issues. I think, I think what's kind of really important though is, um, you know, and we'll get to the data question a little bit later, um, but really, it, it, are you guys interested in just doing something for the Chesapeake Bay? Or are you guys interested in doing something that will help you inform your regional allocation scheme? I think that's what this question is to get us back on track. I think that's what this question really, really is trying to get at. Okay. Uh, so with that, sort of refreshing our perspective on it. Uh, I'll call on Max and certainly uh, like to hear from anybody else. Uh, in response to this. Go ahead, Max. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think Matt might have answered my question. I, I guess I'm I'm getting a little confused on on the timing of all of this, given I've heard a couple of different things. On the one hand, given our last decision to not delay the benchmark spatial modeling is really not going to be the focus of that benchmark. Um, but I think I heard that given what our answers are on these next set of questions, the TC and ERP work group will start working on some of that stuff, although it's again, it's not going to be the focus of the next benchmark. And then I think I heard a little later that it's a much more stepped you know, stepwise fashion where this will not be worked on in the interim, it'll be preserved until after the benchmark is completed. So I guess I'm looking just for a little clarification, for my own understanding, the guidance that we might be able to provide today is that even though we're not delaying the benchmark, is the ERP worker gonna try to make some progress on that stuff during the next benchmark? So it's, sort of more fluid, or is it really going to be this stepwise fashion? I think I heard the answer, but it's still yeah. a little hazy. Well, that, I mean, let's face it, we'll probably end up talking about it. I, my, my gut tells me we'll, we'll probably end up being yet another, um, uh, you know, a research recommendation at the end of the next benchmark. Um, 
and hopefully that we'll get some more direction from the peer review about how to do that and how to accomplish that. Um, so, so the answer the answer is that you know is an affirmative. Yeah, it will be it will be discussed. We won't work on it. It won't be part of the next assessment. Um, nobody's going to come up with a you know a magical analysis at the last minute. Hopefully, that will you know that will resolve a spatial issue. So we won't be working on it. But if you if in the benchmark after next, you know, given the answers that you guys have had, um, then we will start working on some spatial issues. Um, and so prior to that, we're going to need to discuss things, depending on your answers to the next question, um, you know, about that sort of what that spatial component looks like um, and how it can best fit into your management plan. You guys don't have to, you know, somebody suggested, you don't have to do this now. You know, you can provide us input along the process, um, so that it becomes a lot more. It becomes a lot more fluid. So, does that answer your question, Matt? Yeah, it does. Thank you, Matt. I, I think just to hammer home that last point, that um, I don't think the intent here is to not try to provide the input uh, that you're seeking. You know, just because we bought ourselves some time with our last decision. Obviously, um, we want to keep this thing moving forward and give you guys as much intel as as we can, so you can get started with this next benchmark during the next benchmark. Thanks. Tony, we uh, raised hands. Uh, we have two last hands up: uh, Lynn Fagley and then Connor McManus. Uh, go ahead, Lynn. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for letting me speak again. So just to step through this, um, does the information for Chesapeake Bay take precedence? Um, I would say absolutely yes. It's the most, the biggest estuary, you know, on the East Coast and one of the most important nursery areas. And, and of course it takes precedence. But I don't think that it's really about regional allocation at this point. I think it's about understanding um, the dynamics of the fishery, so we understand um, the impacts of Menhaden harvest within the bay. So I think it's I think it's really about um, getting a better idea of the fishery and stock dynamics within the bay. But that is going to take data. We really are going to need new data streams to drive that. Um, so I think that that needs to be a priority from today. Um, and as for the simplified Chesapeake Bay only approaches that could take less time, I think without that additional data, what we're gonna have, um, if we go into this index type management, which I'm not opposed to, but that is gonna be, you know, a bit of a, of a value judgment. It's gonna take a pretty intensive process to come to agreement on what sort of action you take um, with a given index outcome. And, and, you know, I want to say that I really appreciate all of our public commenters. And I think what we heard are, you know, a couple of very different perspectives about what is happening in the Bay. And that right there tells us that it's, you know, without really hard information, um, it's going to be a, it's going to be a, a not impossible, but difficult process um, to come to agreement using um, sort of a traffic light approach, if you will. So yes, the Bay should take precedence and we need data. Thank you. Thanks, Lynn. Uh, before I go to, to Connor, uh, when approximately would the next benchmark be after the 2025 benchmark? If I'm not mistaken, and Kirby can probably, or, or Somebody else can probably correct me. I believe it's six years out between benchmarks. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So that would be 2031. Uh, no. Yeah, 2031. <laughs> believe it or not. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, Connor, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Lynn spoke to a lot of the points that I was um, going to reinforce, but I just wanted to provide that uh, or let it be known that there we use a similar 
standalone approach here and around for Narragansett Bay in terms of managing our what we would call Menahaden management area within within the bay. Um, it's a standalone analytical tool um, that could be of use, um, at least as an example, for if there was interest in applying a similar approach to other estuaries. Um, I guess I would just add that it does take data and at at pretty fine temporal scales. So um, if that was of interest, um, it probably isn't worth going through all the details of that here, but um, I'd be happy to follow up with folks offline, whether it's the TC or whatnot, um, to help relay some of that that uh, information um, for people to take a look at if it's uh, useful. But again, the take home being that it does require a commitment to sampling the region. Thanks. Thank you, Con. Uh, Con, any other hands? We have Tom Fody. All right, go ahead, Tom. Well, I'm just sitting here looking at timelines, and I was it. Well, I was going to ask the same question you just did. It's 2031. Well, let me see where we're going to be in 2031. We're going to be eight more years or nine more years of global warming. By 2031, we'll probably have a couple of thousand windmills out into the into the ocean at that time. If everything proceeds as we're going here. And most of us sitting around the table, since I will be 85 in 2031, and a lot of other people that are younger than me will be retired by that point, there'll be a whole new board and everything handling these problems. So we are pushing it down the, the track. But I, you know, I, sometimes we need to look at wh wh where we are and where we're going, how long it's going to take us to get there. And um, eight years from now, it's, it's a long time. Yes, yes, I, I agree. Yeah, it's just pretty sobering when you think about <clears throat> that far into the future when you're our uh, mature age, Tom. And uh, yeah, but, uh, and I know it's frustrating to folks who would like to see things change in what they believe is a necessary positive direction much quicker. But, but I do think we we've always hung our hat on you know, quantitative base science as best we can. Admitted, believe that we implemented a bay cap out of cautionary measure um and so uh okay um if it's just in the interest of moving forward is, is there anybody that has strong opposition to to maybe focusing on this simplified chesapeake bay approach for the rest of the discussion i see no hands hand. no hands for that no hand. okay matt let's uh we've got what okay. you need to move along yep so next slide, please. That brings us, speak, speaking of data. Next slide, please. So did that change for you guys? Because it hasn't changed for me. Up oh, there we go. So this sort of gets back to the sort of funding priorities. You know, if you're if you're looking at a Chesapeake Bay specific information, um, you know, we're go we're going to need to to fund abundance surveys that include the Chesapeake Bay. Um, if we're moving more towards a coastwide spatial information that's desired, then we'll have to fund some spatially explicit um, diet data to do that. Um, and the funding for model, you know, funding for model development may shorten our time. Frame. Basically, the more money you throw at this problem, um, the, the shorter the time horizon. Next slide. Wait a minute. Go back. Go back again. Ah, okay. This is question four. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, so question four comes around, you know, is is a rough approximation of Chesapeake Bay, you know, based on historical tagging going to be sufficient? Um, or do you guys going to want updated um, Chesapeake, uh, specific Chesapeake Bay information? Um, and the reason why this is really important is, you know, the, the historical tagging information is great, but it's a little old. Um, Chesapeake Bay specific information recent is going to require funding and new abundance surveys um, to provide that data to you. 
And if we're going to be doing that, even though it seems like it's eight years away, we're going to have to start thinking about, um, you know, about what those surveys look like and who's going to pay for them probably fairly soon along. I think I so probably that, know the answer to this question, but I will certainly offer the board opportunity to weigh in on this just a little heads up we're encroaching in on our planned first break so i'm going to rush everybody but, uh, uh, we are we are winding down but this is this is where the rubber hits the road here so uh, uh if you got a comment in response to this please raise your hand and with the with the caveat again this isn't going to be binding for this you know for this assessment and we can if you guys can't really decide right now that's okay we'll talk about this more later I don't have any hands. No hands. Okay. I think folks are as committed as they want to be, Matt. <laughs> so, That's okay. Uh, but on behalf of the board, I, I do think that, that we're always interested in the most recent information that can be acquired and that what the board really needs is, you know, where are where are the priority data needs? What what exists now that could be continued or enhanced, what needs to be started that hasn't been either ever done or hasn't been done in a long time. Um, and then you know, we can apply our our efforts to, to getting the resources necessary to do that. And that's and that's a really good point. What I what I will bring up um, is something that Sarah has prodded me to say. Um, to the to the effect of, you know, if this is important, if getting research, getting recent research information to inform this sort of approach is something that you guys want, we need funding sources, um, and we need, you know, we need we need people's time in order to be able to do this type of stuff. So, you know, that's that's the other thing to keep in mind. It, it might be it might be good to say that that you want the most recent spatial information possible. But we're we're not going to be able to bring that to you if there's not a funding source identified for it. All right, thank you. Well, Matt, are you comfortable with where where you are with board input? Yeah, I think so. I just uh, we just have the we can skip the next slide and just go off to questions unless uh, sorry I overrode Tony. So yeah, oh, okay. yeah. Go ahead, Tony. I just had one um, hand up with a question from Robert LaFrance. All right, go ahead, Rob. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to kind of relay my interest in finding out more and making certain that as we look at this, we look at the experience in Rhode Island and the Narragansett Bay. I think there may be some really good information. They've been working in that program, so I'm happy to hear we put that on the table. I just want to support us looking at that as we start to think about the Chesapeake Bay. Narragansett and Chesapeake Bay, I think there's some potential good overlap between the two. Yeah, Jason uh, McManamy. Jason McManamy is on our is on our committee, so he's been harping on this too. So we'll definitely take a look at this. All right, Matt. Um, what you need to wrap us up here. If we can move two slides forward. That's that's the end of the presentation. So I'll let you guys ask any other further questions that you guys have. Um, and other than that, I'm done. All right. Uh, thanks, Matt. That's been good. I, I, that really helped us uh, focus in on the decisions we needed to make. I um, appreciate the board's uh, forbearance and uh, participation in this. Is there any, uh, any last questions for Matt? Is your opportunity okay. to we now have justin davis and roy miller uh, go ahead justin go ahead justin can't hear you uh, hold on i'm he was muted there we go oh yeah there you can go. you hear me now yep all right thanks mr chairman um so matt to summarize if between now and when the technical group was ready to begin working on the next benchmark, if no new data were collected, no new data programs 
were started, no new studies. Would it be fair to say that the only thing that might be able to be done is that core spatial BAM with the coastwide ERPs, which, if I read the memo correctly, could be attempted with existing data, but would not provide resolution of the Chesapeake Bay separate from Maryland and Virginia coastal waters, and obviously wouldn't include any new information about abundance in Chesapeake Bay. So, I mean, I guess that's my first question. If no new data are generated, no new studies are started, is that the only possibility? And then to what degree would you think that approach would be useful at all in answering questions about localized depletion in Chesapeake Bay or the appropriateness of the Bay Cap? Yeah, you're you're pretty much you're pretty much on track. We can try. We'll try to do something um, based with whatever data that we have in hand um, for the benchmark after next. Um, but you know, we will be we will be hamstrung by the amount of data, and ultimately, whatever we come up with will have to pass through peer review. So, which is a fairly high bar. So, I don't want to rule anything in or anything completely out. If, if if you understand where I'm going. Well, we'll have to get there when we get there. Um, but if you guys if you guys want something that's more spatially explicit, particularly for the Chesapeake Bay, then we need to start thinking about what that what data streams we need to get them rolled. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, thanks, Matt. All right, Roy, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I confess, Mr. Chair, the more I've listened to this, the more I'm getting some cold feet, or maybe it's buyer's remorse. Um, I'm just wondering, until 2025 and then another six years beyond that, uh, since I'm in the same year class that Tom Fody is, um, I, I won't be around probably for that 2031 assessment. So uh, between now and then, are we annually going to struggle with the question of what is an appropriate Chesapeake Bay quota? Uh, how do we answer questions raised by um, advocates like uh, Tom Lilly, Phil, and Phil? Um, how do we answer those questions between now and then? Now, I was interested in, in response to Justin Davis's question, and I think Matt gave me a little more assurance that we're not totally going to ignore these questions between now and then. Um, but anyway, I just wanted to say that I'm, I'm somewhat uncomfortable with delaying everything until 2031 with regard to Chesapeake Bay. Thank you. Spud, I have Bob on that might be able to address this 2031 question. All right, go ahead, Bob. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, all this talk about 2031 is kind of getting depressing. Um, the the benchmark timeline that the commission uses, you know, it's a five and six year trigger. We try not to go much more beyond that without making sure we do a benchmark for all the species, and that's really just to distribute the work and, and sort of the realization that anything, you know, significantly shorter than that, maybe the data hasn't changed and the world hasn't changed very much. So it probably doesn't make to do make sense to do benchmarks more frequently. But, you know, that timeline is, is variable. If the policy board thinks that they want, you know, a, a benchmark in three years following the next benchmark that the, and the technical folks think they can get the spatial work completed in that time, then you know, then we can prioritize that and, and make it work. It, it's, you know, the, the, the six year number is just a guideline to give, you know, make sure we address all of our species, but if there's the ability of the technical folks to get the work done and, and the interest of getting it done faster, then that's, you know, that's up to the policy board to prioritize that. We can speed things up and maybe have a couple of commissioners still uh, at, the ta at the table, but it, you know, I get it. 2028 versus 2021, 31 is not that different, but you know, there, there's there's some flexibility in the system. I guess is my point. Thanks, Bob. Uh, that's that's a useful perspective. Uh, but you know, just to bring us back to, to the reality is that you know we 
we've got to have data collection processes in place and sustain them to produce the kind of data inputs that are necessary for this type of management approach. And that, you know, that's, we've talked about that for years and years a lot about a lot of our other management plans is that you know, we always fight to, to maintain existing data collection processes and to add new ones um, as science evolves. So, you know, to me, that's where I see the biggest limiting factor is, are we going to have the data we need for the technical committee and the art work group to do what we expect of them? So with that, I'll, I'll be quiet. Any, any further questions for Matt? So I have, and, I don't know, Dennis Abbott and Tom Fody, I don't know if you're a leftover hand or not. Joe Cimino. So Tom is a, um, Tom, your hand is up right now. It's going up and down. So I'm not sure you're, you're meaning to. And then I have a member of the public. All right, go ahead, Dennis. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. I was interested in Tom Fody's remarks about how old he will be in 2031. 2031, I'll, if I'm fortunate, I'll be 91. So I don't expect to have be having any part in this final decision-making process. However, it seems to me that the very fact that we're even looking at the Chesapeake Bay and populations of Menhaden in the Bay and listening to the remarks of Tom Lilly and Phil Zelazak. Just the fact that we're doing this to me is admitting that there is a problem in the Chesapeake Bay. And if there isn't a problem in the Chesapeake Bay, if people believe that, then why are we even doing this? And if we do believe that there's a problem in the Chesapeake Bay, I think we should be taking some more immediate action to change things there as opposed to waiting five to ten years down the road to come up with something we're living in such a world now as tom says with climate change the decisions that we make are always going to be further subject to further change matt talked earlier about you know what do you want you want something rough well, what, how do you describe rough or better or best or whatever? We will never have the best science. We're always going to be at some intermediate point. So I think that at some point we have to make some practical decisions about what we should do in Chesapeake Bay. Should we be cutting down, making an effort to cut down on the 51,000 metric tons taken in the Chesapeake Bay as a precautionary measure. You know, it just seems logical that none of us have talked about trying to reduce the overall quota. There just seems to be an interest in moving that quota outside of Chesapeake Bay. And it would seem like that shouldn't be such a hard decision to make. But those are just the comments that I would make. And I also note during Matt's presentation that I don't know how many times he mentioned funding, funding, funding. You know, is it a worthwhile expenditure of how much money, you know? Anyway, that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you, Let's go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair, and I've, I've kind of been hinting at this the last couple of meetings, but I'll I'll put it out there again. And that's just as we talk about environmental conditions changing, um, my concern for us keeping track of stock contribution uh, from non-traditional areas and, and areas outside of the bay. So I, I'll just put this out to uh, Matt Sierra and others that you know thinking of ways that we can kind of keep track of and start to think about, um, you know, if they're one-time studies uh, like Dr. Aniston has done in the past, or or if there's ongoing work that we can do to kind of get to the contribution of different producer areas for this stock, I think it's very important. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Matt. 
do. All right, we've sort of encroached in on our plan. Break. Are there any other raised hands, Tony? Yeah, Tom, Tony, and then that's it. All right, go ahead, Tom. We'll give you the last word on this. Yeah, and I, I'm listening to Dennis and I'm listening to Joe, and that's my my concern. We're in an expedited global warming concern. We're having sea level every year. It gets, seems to get faster and faster. Sea level rises in the last ten years is getting faster and faster every year that we pass by. So when I'm looking at what's going on ten years from now, it might be the, the Gulf of Maine is the major producing area for Maine Hayden. I don't know. And I think we have to be adaptable enough to handle that. And that's, I think, more important than how we do spatial planning is how we do the spatial planning to basically handle the changes that's going to go on in the next eight years. Because we all know there's going to be a drastic amount of change. If, if we've seen the last 10 years and how, or the last 20 years and see what happened since 1989, when I first started noticing the global warming because of bluefish. And it's now moving at a very fast rate. A lot faster than it was back then. So that that's what my concerns lay. Yeah, I think all of us share those concerns, Tom. I mean, it, I've, I've oftentimes descri described uh, this population dynamics as trying to describe the shape of a lava lamp. It's constantly moving, constantly changing in, in ways that we oftentimes didn't foresee and certainly didn't predict. So, a good discussion. Uh, thanks, everybody. Thank you, Matt. Uh, for helping uh, lead us to a, to a conclusion on this. Uh, we're going to take a break right now. Uh, we will reconvene at 2.40, and we'll start discussing the update on the draft addendum 1 or uh, amendment 3. So we'll see everybody back at 2.40. Thank you. I'll be around if you need me. Thanks, Matt. All right, I have uh, 2.40, so hopefully everybody's back from our short break. Um, our next agenda item, uh, we've got a couple hours, and uh, certainly if we need to carry that uh, into our uh, update on Menhaden, we'll all the events we can. Uh, but uh, I'd like to try to make progress, so uh, just a few comments before I turn it over to, to Kirby. And just to, to review what I said earlier at the beginning of the meeting, um, what we want to do is provide an overview of what the PDT has done thus far based on the work um, of the, uh, the work group, which was which was great and I think uh, greatly helped the PDT focus in. Uh, but the way they've got the, the document organized, you've got a, a statement of the problem for, for each topic and objectives on how to address the stated problem. And then there's a series of questions pursuant uh, to that. So what um, what we're gonna do, Kirby's gonna do is sort of go through it. And I wanna um, you know, focus on the, the problem statement and the objectives first, if we can make sure that those comport with the will of the board and the understanding of the board that we can address the question. So uh, Kirby, are you ready to go? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just going to get the uh, controls uh, squared away so I can present to the board. Make sure that you guys can see um, my presentation. All right. Yeah. Okay, great. So, good afternoon, everyone. I have a long presentation, as uh, Spud noted, to provide a progress update on the PDTs work in developing draft addendum one to amendment three and to get board guidance um, and continuing work 
on this addendum, so please get comfortable. First, I wanted to provide a brief background. The board initiated a draft addendum in August. The PDT was formed at the end of the month and has met six times over the last two months. The board working group report served as basis in developing management alternatives that the PDT has developed. And the PDT has encountered a few challenges, most notably time constraints, complexity of the issues to be addressed in the board motion, and the need for the board to provide further guidance. The PDT developed a memo to highlight work done and focus board attention on areas for further development. And the three main topics that I'll be talking about today are allocation, incidental catch, and small-scale fisheries, and the episodic set-aside program. I wanted to make sure everyone is aware, as um, Chairman Woodward noted, the memo uh, that he referenced was included in supplemental materials, and I will be referring to the document and page numbers throughout the presentation. So specifically, the plan development team has developed for each topic a statement of the problem, an objective to address that problem, initial management alternatives and goals, as well as key questions and recommendations. So today, the PDT is looking for the board to confirm that draft statement of the problem and objective for each topic. Consider the plan development team's recommendations and address the key questions that have been put forward in that memo. So in terms of my presentation outline, I'm going to work through the memo today by briefly going through the current management program for each topic, then the statement of the problem, the objective, the management alternatives, the plan development recommendations, the board can consider each of these issues in their entirety. At that point, I'll take any questions from the board overall on what I've presented thus far. Then we will revisit the topic for the board to confirm under each of the three main ones I mentioned, allocation, incidental catch and small scale fisheries, and the episodic set aside to get the board to confirm the statement of the problem and objective, consider the plan development team recommendations, and then provide answers to the key questions. So the first issue, allocation. Quickly, I just want to make sure that everyone is going off of the same information to begin with. This is our current allocations from Amendment 3. And the formula is set up that each jurisdiction gets a 0.5% allocation. And then the remaining TAC, the total allowable catch, is allocated based on the three-year average of historical landings from 2009 to 2011. To help set the stage briefly, I wanted to remind the board of general trends in recent landings. So on the screen right now is a table you've seen from a previous presentation I gave a few meetings ago and is not included in the memo, but it highlights landings both before Amendment 3 was implemented, you know, so 2013 through 2017, and since 2018 through 2020. And this information is, is based off of uh, the preliminary compliance reports. I'll just note that there's one uh, small change to this to what I had presented before, which is I have a percentage for New Hampshire's landings, as they've indicated to us for 2020, as information is no longer confidential. An additional consideration that the board has seen before is how quota transfers have changed over time with changes in allocation. Similar to the last slide, this has been presented and was included in the Menhaden Workgroup Report. So just to, to make sure people are aware of what they're seeing again, the gray cells indicate transfers that increase quota, and bolded cells indicate states that transfer quota every year since the implementation of Amendment 3. So for this first topic, allocation, the statement of the problem, reads that the current allocations have resulted annually in the tax not being fully landed, while at the same time some jurisdictions do not have enough quota to maintain directed fisheries. Quota transfers alone are not enough to ameliorate this issue. Some jurisdictions have become reliant on the episodic event set-aside program and internal catch provision to maintain their fishery, while other jurisdictions regularly do not land their allocation. For the allocation objective to address that statement of the problem, 
allocations should be adjusted to align with recent availability, not long-term average availability of the resource. Ensure jurisdictions can maintain directed fisheries with minimal interruptions during the season. Reduce the need for quota transfers and fully utilize the annual tax without overage. Again, both the statement of the problem and the objective for this topic and the next two topics we'll get through have been drafted by the plan development team. And we're going to be looking for the board to confirm that these match with what the board feels are, are correct and needed. In terms of the allocation management alternatives, the plan development team used the same two-step approach as outlined in Amendment 3. So first, consider the fixed minimum allocation, and then second, allocate the remaining tag based on time frame. For the fixed minimum allocation, the PDT centered on two main alternatives. First, reducing the fixed minimum from the current 0.5% to between 0.1% to 0.3% for all jurisdictions. Doing so in combination with a more recent time frame allocation would redistribute a latent quota away from jurisdictions not fully using their current allocation. The other idea is to create a tiered fixed minimum allocation. For example, tier one could include jurisdictions landing 0.1% or less of the average coastline landings. Tier two could include jurisdictions landing more than 0.1% but less than 2%. 0.2% of the average coastwide landings, and Tier 3 could include jurisdictions landing 0.2% or more of average coastwide landings. In this example, percentages of attack for the tiers 1 through 3 could be 0.01%, 0.2%, and 0.5% respectively. What I've outlined on the screen is just an example, and it's important to note that these breaks um, are, are arbitrary. If the board is interested in this approach, the plan development team needs guidance on what the criteria should be used to set these different tiers. I'm going to outline each of the alternatives under the second step, again, which is considering the time frame to allocate the remaining tag. The first is to use a longer time series average. This approach considers a broader landing history from all jurisdictions, including times of higher and lower landings, and incorporates more recent years in the time frame. However, this option could dilute more recent changes in the fishery given the rate of change. The second is to consider a more recent time series average. This approach reflects the most recent landings and information and is more likely to align with current stock distribution. The strategy does not take into account past landings that likely represent previous stock distributions. The third would be to use a weighted allocation approach. This approach considers both recent and historical timeframes. Similar to the longer time series average approach, this may dilute more recent changes in the fishery given the rate of change possibly to a lesser degree due to averaging over a few years. Weighting of the time periods could be even, you know, at 50-50 or uneven, either at 75-25 in either direction. And the fourth is a moving average concept. This would utilize a three-year moving average lagged by one year to allow finalizing the data in time to inform jurisdictions of their quota. So the 2019 through 2021 average would be used to set the 2023 allocation. This option could reduce the uncertain or would reduce the uncertain that would reduce the certainty the jurisdictional allocations provide as we currently have in Amendment 3, but could also alleviate the need to revisit allocations as as often um, that you might be doing so with some of these other approaches. I'll note that there are some key questions for each of these steps, the fixed minimum allocation and allocating the remaining time frame that we'll get to uh, later on in the presentation. Now I'll go through other allocation management alternatives listed in the memo. The pool quota concept is where you would group jurisdictions that have small bait fisheries, no directed fishery, and no recent landings. A benefit of this approach is that it could reduce the administrative burden on these jurisdictions by not having them have in-season monitoring, um, and also by pulling them together, like landings would be well below their allocation with an added buffer. The work group report proposed this strategy, but the board had not expressed interest in moving away from jurisdictional allocations. So the plan development team is looking for the board to clarify 
whether this should be pursued further. The next two strategies or alternatives I'll go through briefly. A second best peer approach is trying to use the, a similar concept as the weighted allocation, but would utilize the jurisdiction's best landing sheet from 2009 to 2020 to determine an allocation. The idea behind this strategy is that it may be less of a historical outlier than a best year, and therefore better representative of current fishing needs. A period of high abundance or availability for a particular jurisdiction could potentially co coincide with restrictive measures for another jurisdiction and vice versa. So it becomes very difficult to try to compare each jurisdiction's best or second best year against each other over time. The other one is an open allocation or open fishery approach where the fishery would not have any set allocations for several years and then based off of each jurisdiction's landings during this period and allocations could be based. This was included as an idea that uh, the plan development team discussed uh, because there was initially thought that there could be some additional caps, so to speak, under the current tax based on recent years' landings. But looking at the data further, it was determined that this was not truly a viable or feasible option because of um, limitations in that cap. And so the plan development team recommends that both the second best year strategy and open fishery not be included in the draft addendum. So I just wanted to include for this presentation um, some of the time frame allocations in terms of what they would look like for the states. These tables I'm going to go through are, are on pages six and seven in the memo. The first one is basically using our 0.5 percent base minimum allocation established in Amendment 3 and then combining that with different time frames. So you've got a longer time frame, a slightly shorter but more recent time frame, and then two more recent shorter time frames. Towards the end, you can see there are um, weighted allocations as well. For Table 2, this is using the same 0.5 minimum allocation approach, but then is trying to use a three-year moving average. Again, this can be found on page seven in the memo. And the last one that I wanted to highlight is just the pool quota alternative, which again is, is found on page seven and just indicates what uh, the pooled approach could look like for some of the more southern states. In terms of recommendations, the plan development team is highlighting that the tiered approach needs further guidance from the board on what to set those tiers at. Additionally, we need to get clarification on whether to include a pool quota alternative. When it comes to the weighted allocation idea, we need the board to help us limit the number of weighted allocation options. As, as noted, it could be 50-50, 75-25, or 25-75. Choosing one of those would, would likely be best so as to limit the universe of potential options. And then again, to not include in the draft addendum, a longer time series given its similarity to the weighted allocation approach, the second best year strategy, and the open fishery, and then reallocate approach. So that wraps up allocation. The second issue topic is incidental catch in small scale fisheries. I'm gonna just highlight again for the board in terms of our status quo right now, after a pool allocation is met for a jurisdiction, the fishery moves to an incidental catch fishery where small scale gears and non-directed gear types can land up to 6,000 pounds per trip and up to 12,000 pounds for two authorized individuals working from the same vessel fishing stationary multi-species gear. The list of eligible gear types for both of these are listed in Amendment 3. Helping considering recent incidental catch, the plan development team put the following table together to highlight the increase of landings attributed to per se. In 2017, which again is before Amendment 3 was finalized, and since, so 2018 through 2020. So as shown on the screen, the percentage of landings coming from per se has increased to 88 and 89% in 2019 and 2020. 
Both this table and the next one I'll cover can be found on page 11 in the memo. So the table on the screen now shows the total number of incidental landing trips per year in by total landings in pound average amount per trip. So the top row in the table shows the trips in by landings in pounds. So one to 1,000 pounds, 1,001 to 2,000 pounds. Since the provision was first implemented under Amendment uh, 2 to present, the majority of the trips fall within 1 to 1,000 pounds, so about 56%. But since the implementation of Amendment 3, there's been a rise in trips landing between 5 to 6,000 pounds. So the greatest percentage of landings during this time period have come from trips landing in this uh, bin. For the incidental catch in terms of the statement of the problem, the PDT has drafted that the intent of this provision was to provide continued access for low volume landings of Menhaden once a jurisdiction's directed fishery was met. In recent years, availability at the northern end of the range has resulted in directed fishery quotas being met earlier in the year. Coastwide landings under this category have exceeded a number of jurisdictions directed quotas and have ranged from 1 to 4 percent of the annual attack. The Amendment 3 language has led to various interpretations of which landings fall under this provision. You know, in particular, once a center allocation is met or whether it's the full jurisdiction's allocation needs to be met. Without changes, landings under this provision may remain at high levels or could increase, which may jeopardize overall management objectives. The plan development team has drafted the following objective to address that statement of the problem, which is sufficiently constrain landings to achieve overall management objectives, such as meeting the needs of existing fisheries, reducing discard mortality by limiting eligible gear types, indicating which state or which landings can occur and those landings are not part of the directed fishery, and establishing trip and seasonal limits. To the incidental catch management alternatives, the plan development team focused on four sub-issues based on the work group report. First, adjusting which or gear types are allowed to count towards the provision. One current alternative would eliminate purse sayings as an eligible gear type. The other would remove small scale gear types from the provision and allow only landings from non directed gears. The second um, sub issue topic is the timing of when incidental catch can occur. Again, this is included given some states are entering into the incidental catch prior to their full allocation being met, which impacts the duration of landings are occurring in this category. The sub-issue alternatives are trying to make the language more clear on when incidental catch can begin. So the first would codify that incidental catch could occur after a jurisdiction subdivided allocation either by sector or fishery or gear is met. The second alternative will clarify that the incidental catch in a state can occur only after the full state allocation is met. And the third alternative is that once an entire jurisdiction's quota allocation is met, the man hidden fishery for the jurisdiction would be closed and no incidental catch would be allowed. The third sub issue is the incidental catch limit and proposes changes to it to reduce the annual volume of incidental catch. The two alternatives under this sub issue are to reduce the trip limit to either 4,500 pounds and up to 9,000 pounds for two individuals or 3,000 pounds and up to 6,000 pounds for two individuals using that same authorized individuals approach that's outlined in the amendment three. The plan development team is looking for clarity from the board on whether adjusting the trip limit is a priority as it's unclear if these changes alone would result in significant reductions in landings. The fourth sub-issue that the plan development team developed is catch accounting. This strategy was highlighted in the work group report and the PDT developed some alternatives on how this could potentially work. The first alternative would create a catch cap similar to that used in the American EEL plan where 1% of the annual, that would be equal to 1% of the annual attack with a 10% management trigger. Landings as reported from compliance reports would be evaluated and if the landings exceeded the cap by more than 10% in a single year or exceeded the cap for two years in a row, the board would need to take action to reduce incidental landings. The second alternative would create an actual set aside of the annual tax similar to the episodic event set aside program. Landings under this provision would count against that set aside 
and if the set aside is exceeded in a given year, the overage would be deducted from the subsequent year's set aside. The third and fourth alternatives are the same two concepts that are just that I just covered, but would be applied only to the small scale directed gear types. In considering this sub issue, the plan development team recommends that it not be included in the draft addendum due to the complexity of potential options above. The goal of catch accounting could be achieved through a combination of reallocation alternatives and other incidental catch sub issues, such as gear restrictions or trip limits. In terms of the plan development team's recommendations to summarize, clarify whether adjusting the trip limit is a priority, and also the PDT recommends not including catch counting in the draft addendum. So the third issue that I'm going to go through before we take questions is the episodic event set aside program. As you all are aware, our status quo sets up a 1% of the tax set aside with episodic events defined as any instance where a qualified state reaches its quota allocation prior to September 1 and the state can prove the presence of unusually large amounts of many in their state waters. Qualified states include Maine through New York, and then there are additional provisions that limit how those states participating in the program can harvest. The plan development team put together the following figure on the screen to highlight the availability of many in the Gulf of Maine using a combination of historical landings information from the fishes of the Gulf of Maine by Bigelow and Schroeder, as well as ACCSP records. The number of consecutive years in either a high or a low uh, category are labeled. For years between 1840 and 1949, which is the gray line in the uh, first part of this figure. It's reconstructed from the description of Menhaden occurrence in fishes of the Gulf of Maine. And the second portion is based off of ACCFP records of Menhaden landings from Maine, New Hampshire, and Massachusetts. Overall, what this shows is that there are extended periods of low and high availability of Menhaden without a clear pattern of when those shifts occur or when, excuse me, when they will occur. In terms of the statement of the problem the plan development team has drafted, over 90% of the episodic set aside has been utilized in all years since 2016. With the increase in Atlantic Menhaden in the Northeast, the program has become a secondary regional quota for several jurisdictions. And the dependency on the episodic set aside program highlights a mismatch between the biomass and current commercial allocations. The plan development team has drafted the following objective, which is to ensure sufficient access to episodic changes in regional availability in order to minimize in-season disruptions and reduce the need for quota transfers and incidental harvest. When it came to developing management alternatives, the plan development team has performed the following, which first is the idea of removing the episodic set-aside program from the management program. While this was not a strategy outlined in the work group report, the plan development team wanted to include it for completeness. And eliminating the 1% set aside in combination with redistributing minimum allocation and changes to the incidental catch provision, it may address regional needs to um, still meet the landings and in in increased availability that have been seen in the area in recent years. The second alternative would be to increase the set aside. The goal in doing this is that it may reduce the need for in-season quota transfers or the reliance on incidental and small-scale um, plannings. For this alternative, there are really two main considerations the plan development team is looking for feedback from the board on. The first is how much to increase the episodic set-aside to. Currently, it's set at 1% of the TAC. A preliminary review of landings data indicate that at least for Maine through Massachusetts, setting this set-aside at 3% of the TAC may have covered their episodic landings plus quota transfers, but to address incidental landings, in addition to that, a higher percentage above 3% would be needed. The second consideration is the source of increased set aside. The plan development team discussed three approaches for supplying this increase that included either increasing the set aside off the top of the tag. Second is considering whether to allow or require relinquished quotas to be redirected to the set aside program or utilizing latent quota for reconstructing the fixed, or restructuring, excuse me, the, the fixed minimum allocation from the allocation section. The PDT also drafted other alternatives based on the strategy 
uh, listed in the work group report. They included adjusting the date in which unused set aside gets redistributed back to the um, the rest of the, the states. Consider additional restrictions on the participants in the set aside program and allow um, access at less than 100% of the jurisdictions allocation being met. In terms of plan development team recommendations, um, they have recommended those all those additional alternatives that were outlined in the work group report not be included, given that they don't appear to be able to fully address some of the issues identified in the statement of the problem. Additionally, the plan development team is looking to clarify the language on whether a state can apply to the exercise set aside program prior to fully landing their allocation. So I've gone through the three main issues and tried to provide an overview of the management alternatives that have been drafted thus far. I'll take any questions at this point. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kirby. Great, great job of summarizing that. Um, uh, obviously, the PDP has done their usual great work in, in, in giving us some a clear statement of problem, uh, like a clear objectives, and then obviously a, a suite of uh, alternatives uh, that we can consider. Uh, but I also like to make, make sure that folks understand that you know, if you think there's something that they've missed, uh, an alternative, you know, that's, that's certainly in bounds, and we'll get to that. Uh, but at this point, uh, you'll raise your hand if you have questions for Kirby. Tony, you can give me the names. Uh, right now, I just have Richie White. All right, go ahead, Richie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I have a concern on reading the objective and then uh, looking at uh, the uh, potential solutions of a quota, quota adjustment. And uh, my question is, are we, is the objective to uh, have the states um, have enough quota to meet their needs, their present needs, uh, without using um, um, the small scale fishery, uh, the episodic event, and transfers. So that that's my first question, and I'd follow up if I could, Mr. Chair. All right, Kirby, you want to respond to that? Sure. Um, so, again, the plan development team drafted the statement of the problem and the objectives off of the work group report and have tried to basically address what would, the issues that were identified through that. Um, so, to that end, if you, if you don't think that your concern is coming through clear enough in the current drafted language, you know, that's what we want to get feedback on and adjust it as needed if, if there's you know more consensus on that. Okay, Richie, yeah, I, I, and I can I'll, I'll opine a little bit on it. I think yes, in, in a in a perfect world the goal would be to establish allocations that do meet the needs of the respective jurisdictions so that we do not have to depend on quota transfers and um, you know the, the other elements of the plan. To, to satisfy the needs of the jurisdiction. So, but we all know that obviously things are fluid, things change, and that we've got to have you know more than one tool in the toolbox. But you have to get a follow on. You wanted to say? Yes, I mean, get, given that answer, and that would that was my assumption of what the objective uh, says. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me uh, that there are limited options, if any options, that provide quota uh, to the New England states to the level at which they're presently harvesting. Uh, I could be wrong on that, um, but for example, New Hampshire um, harvested 1% in the previous two years and were over 1% this year. Um, and 
there's very little, I think there's only one option in, in all of it that would provide 1%. And I looked at, at Maine and Massachusetts, and I think the same situation is there, that when you add up <clears throat> Maine's, um, you know, transfers, episodic event, um, <clears throat> the small-scale fishery and their starting quota, I don't, I'm not sure there's any option in there that comes close to that. Um, so that's my concern, and uh, giving comment on the next uh, next couple of issues will be very hard for me without knowing what quota you start with. So knowing whether we shrink or expand the episodic event will, I think we will need to know that as that the New England states have enough quota. Uh, to harvest what they have been harvesting first before we do, can decide, then yes, episodic, you know, can be X, Y, or Z. Thank you. Well, thank you, Rich. I think that's uh, one of the, the biggest challenges that the PDT has faced, and certainly we face as a board, is that there are these these combinations that produce a uh, if this, then that, result and it's uh, very difficult to predict what all those combinations are. Uh, Kirby would like to comment back to Rich's concern about the the, the his pr projected allocation scenarios based on the different alternatives. Sure, um, you know, I think maybe the, the best way I can put it is, you know, we're going off of empirical information. And so what, what was put together in terms of potential alternatives um, is, is drawing from recent years landings. And so you have up on the screen right now, and it's also, as I said in the memo, your, what the status quo allocation is, and then what the allocation could be based off of time frames. Um, so while I, I hear Richie's concern that, you know, there is a mismatch currently between the allocation and recent landings. There are alternatives in here that try to address that. Um, there are additional combinations, as you highlighted, Spud, of either you know, adjusting the episodic set aside or um, changes to the incidental catch provision. These things could also further impact you know, how how this this plays out, but we are trying to find a balance of what to base these alternatives on. And so if there are different ones, different percentages that the board wants the plan development team to consider, you know, we need to get that guidance from them. Mr. Chair, third follow-up, if I may. So, sorry. No. That's quite all right. No, Rich, this, is, this is complicated business, and I certainly want to make sure we fully illuminate it through discussion. Go okay. right ahead. Um, <clears throat> would it not make some sense to ask each state um, for them to project uh, what they are harvesting? Obviously, it, it, you know, it may not be exactly precise, uh, but then you could see each state, how each state lines up with the projections in the, in the charts, I think. It see, almost seems like we're doing it backwards. We're trying to come up with some scenarios as opposed to backing in from what the states believe they need. So thank you. That, that'll be it. That's, that's quite all right. Yeah, I, yeah. I think you're sort of looking at a uh, a uh, what do we want slash need approach versus what have we always got. And, uh, and, and I don't know, uh, Kirby. What are your what are your thoughts about that in terms of you know, if if each jurisdiction was queried as to what their desired, you know, allocation was, I mean, probably in, in more than 100 percent. But um, how how would that be? How could that be useful uh, in interpreting these various alternatives here and helping the board give the PDT guidance on where to focus its efforts? Yeah, uh, thanks, bud. So, 
I think this actually speaks well to the problem we ran into in trying to evaluate the best year approach uh, that had been put forward in the work report, which is that if you just go off of the best year of each state, then you would get over 100%, so to speak. Uh, that, that's where it, I think it becomes problematic. To Richie's question of projecting landings, I think there would be a number of follow-up questions of what, what you were asking to project. I mean, what I have up on the screen right now is average landings plus the 0 0.05 set, um, and it's still or 0.5 fixed minimum. So this is showing for comparison purposes what your status quo allocation is against alternatives that have been drafted up based off of recent years information. Um, so again, if there is interest in pursuing other ideas, we, we need to know what they would be based off of. And if there's going to be projections, what they would be projecting out. Are we talking about just 2021 landings? Um, are you talking about projecting out previous years or future years? There'd be a number of, I think, kind of follow-up questions to try to better understand what that idea is trying to get at. And also, isn't it correct to say that if, if, for instance, that the board agreed that it wanted to examine the pooled quota concept, and you had a, you know, an illustration where you had uh, four southern states, that would obviously affect the percentages in this table, uh, you know, in terms of what could be redistributed. Is that right? Yes, exactly. So that's what um, I, I moved to further down um, in terms of the different alternatives that have been considered. The pooled approach um, up on the screen right now shows slightly different um, allocations when you combine those four states below uh, North Carolina through Florida into a regional uh, approach. But again, this is you know just off of the plan development team's um, you know, discussions, if, if there is an interest in pursuing this, we, we would also want the board to kind of codify that it would make sense to have those four states in a region, um, or if there's, a, if there's other pooled approaches or other parts of the coast that uh, the, the board would want to see that, we would want to get that information. Okay. All right. Thanks, Kirby. All right. Uh, um, I'm not exactly sure what to do with that one right now, but uh, uh, any additional questions? Um, we do. We, do uh, we have Emerson, Hasbrook, John Clark, and then Lynn Fagley. Okay. Go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I had <clears throat> two questions, one of which was just kind of partially answered by Kirby. So um, for the tables that were in the document, one of which you have on the screen right now, um, as well as the other ones, let's see. Um, you go to what was table one, or maybe this is what was table one. Is, it, is this what was table one in the document, in the memo? Yes, I have up on the screen right. table okay. one. Right, right, okay, and, and once the final one. Okay, so for this table then, the allocations that are in all the different columns other than status quo are based on an initial, an initial um, allocation, which is then modified by what was actually landed in the state in those different time frames. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, we use the six for comparison purposes. This table shows what the using a 0.5 base minimum allocation is in combination with more recent time frames. So status quo is 0.5 plus the three year average of 2009 to 2011. So 2009 to 2020, that column is showing what a 0.5 base allocation is with that time frame in terms of each state's landings as a percentage. Right, the actual landings. Yes. 
Right. Okay. And and then my second question, in a way, was kind of similar to what Richie was getting at. Um, at the beginning of your presentation, you showed a table that was not in the meeting materials. It came from, I guess, someplace else that showed, I think, percentage of TAC over for each state over different time periods? Was that what it was? It was only up on the screen for a short period of time. Yes, I included this uh, table in a previous memo for the board, um, and it just shows based off of compliance report data what percentage each state landed in recent years of the coastwide total. And, and that includes from, from all sources, so that's Landings in the directed fishery plus um, incidental landings as well as episodic event. Is that correct? correct. Okay, so correct. I'm so I'm looking at New York, for instance, right? So New York had 0.69% um, allocation, but if we go all the way across to 2020. New York actually landed 1% of the coastwide landings from all three sources, right? Initial allocation, um, incidental catch, and episodic. Although I don't think New York was in episodic in 2020, but it would it would be for any state it would be from all three sources. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, thank correct. you. Okay, uh, John Clark, I think you're up next, and then Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you for the very thorough presentation, Kirby. I'm just curious as to uh, if the uh, BDT had considered lower minimums for minimum allocations, because you know, as a state that actually has a small menhaden fishery, uh, even point, uh, you know, point one percent is um, if my math is correct here, you're still looking at what about 400,000 pounds of of, uh, of quota. Did you consider having like a five one hundredths of a percent minimum or uh, even lower? Um, as I said, we we had the the idea of going below you know point five as your as your fixed minimum to. 0.1 through 0.3 and looked at some different combinations of that. And then the other idea was to have a tiered approach where you could you know, have as low as a 0.1. Um, so we haven't explored anything less than a 0.1. Um, if there's interest in the board wanting to pursue that, we, we want to get that on the record. And so we, we could pursue it further. But right now that that was the range, you know, our right. no, I, I, I'm just, you know, as I said, uh, some of the states, like, not to pick on Pennsylvania, but obviously they're not going to land, you know, uh, half a percent. They're not even going to land a hundredth of a percent, a hundredth of a hundredth of a one percent. So, you know, it just seems like maybe we do have a little more flexibility. I know that's not going to create a lot more quota for to allocate to other states, but I think, um, you know, as we've seen since we did a minimum allocation of half percent to every state that it results in a kind of complicated system of either uh, uh, transfers or uh, giving up quota before the the fishing year starts. So, you know, again, uh, just to tie it in more with what's actually being caught. Thanks. So, John, um, you know, are you recommending that that be considered by the PDT that this this first tier, it says 0.1% or less, is that they explore the less part of that. Is that correct? Yes, I, I would suggest exploring the less, uh, you know, as I said, it is a state. We do have a fishery. We have uh, landings every year, but, um, you know, the, the half percent, uh, that's why we relinquish uh, most of our quota every year because we're never going to land it. And we'd like to, you know, see it go to states that need to tax. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Let me let me ask you one more question just to make sure I understand it right. Maybe this will help both Kirby and I get this straight. 
after meetings for that. Right now, that's in, that's included in the the six minimum tier approach. Would 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 you like for it to stay there, or and we get a little bit ahead of ourselves, but are you really talking about maybe it even being included in step the step above it where it says reduce fixed minimum allocation that that 0.1 percent actually be less than 0.1 percent uh yeah uh thank you mr chair i i would like to see it uh whatever we consider for a fixed minimum is to have it less than a tenth of a percent because i think less than a tenth of a percent would uh take care of uh several of the states and you know the fixed minimum tier, I think, is a great idea to have, you know, depending on what states actually catch. So anything that would free up the tax so it doesn't have to be transferred or relinquished, I think, reduces uh, bureaucratic burden and also makes sure that the tax goes to where it's most needed. Thanks. Thank you, John. All right, Lynn, you're next. Thanks. I actually think I'm out of order. I don't have a question. Um, I'm assuming we're going to go through these issue by issue, right? We're going to step through oh, yeah. the yeah, This, is, yeah. this okay, is really so. just, this is just questions to make sure that we sort of understand what the PDT has brought to us, and then we're going to have to go back and dive deeper into each yeah. other. So I, I'm, I'll hold then. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Tony, any other hands up? One last hand, Connor McManus. All right. Go ahead, Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a quick question for Kirby. Um, I guess, given where we are at now with timelines in the in the PDT document. Has there been discussions um, about including 2021 20, landings in this? I only ask in the context of um, how fisheries may have been impacted by 2020 as well as um, trying to get the most up-to-date perspective as to where um, states given fisheries are. Um, I hear, um, I understand um, John's comments well and just try to think in the context of States that um, that that may have 2021 lands that are better reflective of their uh, fishery at this point. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Connor. Um, the plan development team has not discussed that. So, if there is interest by the board in wanting to use 2021 landings information, um, I would just offer maybe a couple considerations. Right now, in terms of the alternatives that have been drafted, especially for the allocation section, have been crafted using validated landings from ACCSP. Um, so that meant they went back to each of the jurisdictions to get confirmation that it's the best available data. If there is interest in using Planning's information through 2021, then we may be dealing with a a longer time frame to get this addendum completed. Um, compliance reports are due by the spring. The board reviews those, so there would be probably at the you know earliest if there was an interest in just using compliance report data, the, the May meeting. But even then. Uh, or our spring ASFC meeting, that would be challenging. So I, I would just offer that if there's an interest in looking at 2021 data, to keep in mind that it would change the timeline of when this addendum could be uh, finalized for public comment or for the board's review to consider for public comment. Yeah, that's a good point, Kirby. Just make, make sure I'll reiterate what he said, just to make sure everybody understands that, that we're we're on a timeline for any changes that result from final approval of addendum one to be effective the 2023 fishing year. Uh, if we do make a decision that we want to include 2021 landings information in the analyses, then I guess it could potentially jeopardize our ability to have the results of the addendum effective for the 2023 fishing year. Is that, is that a fair statement, Kirby? Yes. Okay. All right. Um, any other hands up, Tony? David Borden. All right. Go ahead, David. 
Her Herbie, um, under de minimis, uh, what does a state qualify for uh, for landing? How many pounds? Uh, that's a good question that I don't know off the top of my head, but give me a minute, I'll double check. Uh, you don't need to answer immediately, but I, I'm just following up on the point that uh, John Clark made, and uh, I may want to discuss that when we get to the next phase, Mr. Chairman. All Thank right. you. Thank you. All right. You want to any hands up, Tony? That's all, Spud. Okay. All right, Kirby, you ready to move on to the next phase of this? Sure thing. Just one note uh, for de minimis to be eligible, a state's bait landings must be less than 1% of the total coastwide bait landings for the most recent two years. All right, any follow up on that, David Board? Not now, Mr. Chairman. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, Kirby, proceed. Okay. Great. Um, so what we are going to do now is revisit each of the topics that I went through. Again, we're looking for the board to confirm the statement of the problem and objective and consider the plan development team recommendations and provide answers to some of the key questions that were posed in the memo. So um, on the screen for the allocation uh, topic, this is a, I've put basically the statement of the problem in bullets. If you're looking for the exact wording, it is on page two in the memo. And again, what we're looking for is for the board to confirm that, you know, that this is addressing really the, the issues that the board feels are, are, are key in being identified with this issue in the fishery. When it comes to the objective, again, we are listing out what we plan development team based off of those issues identified in the work group report uh, seem to feel that these uh, need to be uh, addressed through the management alternatives. So as a way of kind of checking to ensure that the alternatives that have been drafted up are addressing the statement of the problem, we are trying to check those against this objective. So for allocation, whether those allocation alternatives align with the recent availability of the resource, ensure jurisdictions can maintain their directed fisheries with minimum interruptions, reduce the need for quota transfers, and to fully utilize the annual TAC without overages. I right, think about Kirby. Uh, uh, let, let's uh, go back. Let's let's kind of work through this piece by piece. Go back to the statement of the problem, and we'll sort of work our way back down. Um, is there anyone that feels like this statement of the problem needs to be modified? Is does not adequately capture the issue? Uh, you know, we could probably wordsmith the minutia of it all day, but. If you've got strong feelings that this uh, needs to be modified, please raise your hand. Any hands, Tony? I have one hand, Lynn Fagley. All right, go ahead, Lynn. Yeah, just real quick with this um, first bullet, states do not have enough quota to ma maintain directed fisheries. I wonder if an important part of that has to do with maintain current directed fisheries because as a board i wonder if it is our intention to always ensure that states can maintain directed fisheries that are not limited in capacity you know they have fisheries that um are able to grow through the roof for whatever reason or another and that's a little bit of a different issue than maintaining you know, sort of the current infrastructure. I just throw that out there because I think there's a nuance there that's pretty important. Uh, thank you, Lynn. It's sort of like Argus in the eye of the beholder. So, uh, 
So what you're proposing is potentially insert the word current erected fisheries, and that would imply that it was current at the time that the, I guess the addendum uh, was adopted. Is that is that correct? That's what I'm thinking. Okay. All right. Chair, you have Joe Semino and Emerson Hasbrook. All right, go ahead, Joe. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mr. Chair. I, I think, you know, I, I appreciate all the PDT's work on this, but I, I, I think, you know, just saying that we need to get allocation right based on current availability makes me a little nervous, although it's obviously an important consideration. There are other reasons why the TAC wasn't being utilized. We tied up a lot of quota um, in places that didn't have any fisheries. Uh, and we heard a public comment today that talked about markets and, and the fact that, you know, they can no longer sell fish as easily as they used to because other states are simply catching their own quota. And, and you know, we've had discussions on what do states need? Well, we've done some very tough reallocations for other species and we didn't get to just base it on what we needed. I, th I think there needs to be some sort of socioeconomic considerations to all of this as well. Thank you. Thank you. Emerson? Go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, relative to the suggestion that Lynn's just made, I, I would suggest that we want to maintain current fisheries, not necessarily current directed fisheries, right? Because some of our current fisheries um, come under, uh, you know, the episodic catch, right, as, as well as the uh, incidental catch. And I know we're going to be talking about incidental catch in a few minutes, but incidental is not necessarily directed, um, but we want to make sure that the states have enough to cover their current fisheries. Um, you know, similar to the question that I was asking previously about the table that was on the screen, that those percentages of that each state caught were from all three sources, right? The directed fishery, the incidental catch, and the episodic catch. So, uh, you know, it, and I know we don't have a motion here, and I, and I think you're probably trying to go through this without motions, but I would rather see enough quota to maintain current fisheries okay. not necessarily directed fisheries all right yeah i think one of the things that also is is confusing about this is you know we've got a situation where the tack you know as it says here tack not being fully landed but then the incidental catches don't count against the tack or they've been made a matter of record in terms of what a jurisdiction has landed, but they're not counted against the tax. So that that's that's another sort of peculiarity of this. I think that it makes uh, this problem statement a little bit difficult sometimes. But uh, I certainly um, so what we've had is a suggestion, of basically replacing the word directed with the word current uh, to encompass all of the sources of, of landings. Uh, is there any well, before I ask that, I guess, are there any other hands up? Tony? We have one hand, Richie White. All right, go ahead, Richie. Uh, thanks. Just quickly, I support uh, either of those changes, uh, Lynn's or Emerson. Thank you. All right. Uh, in the interest of moving forward, is, is there any heartburn opposition to replacing the word directed with current fisheries in this uh, statement of problem? If so, raise your hand. And your reason. Any hands, Tony? I don't, I don't see any hands, Richie White. Your mic is still open, so there we go. You're good. Okay. No hands. Any, any other concerns about the statement of the problem? Uh, I'd like to move on. To, any hands? Emer Emerson's hand is back up. All right, go ahead, Emerson. No, I, I'm sorry. I just get confused here about. When I look at this icon, whether my hand is up or down, 
I thought the red when it's when the red arrow was pointing down, my hand is down. Is that right? No, your hand is up when the red arrow is pointing down. Okay, so there we go. Now it's down. Thanks, Emerson. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, it's totally counterintuitive, but that's what we have. So, okay, Kirby, I think we've got uh, concurrence on the statement of problem. If you want to move on to the objectives slide, okay. Uh, same process here. Um, I want to hear input from the board on the, the language of the objectives here. Is there an opportunity to interject? You like it, not like it? If you don't like it, what would you like to see changed? All right, Tony, any hands? No hands, bud. All right, and we're going to consider that. Good to go. Right, yep. Sorry, they're slow hands today, I guess. Uh, Lynn Fagley followed by Adam Nowalski. All right, go ahead, Lynn. Sorry, right, Mr. Chair, I was trying to count to 10 so I wouldn't be the first hand. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. I, I just think that first objective um, is a little dangerous. I, I think it would be better served to just add the word better in front of a line. And I think it's um important to add that caveat that we need to consider uh infrastructure and past fishery performance i don't think we can turn our back on given the way the stock moves up and down i don't think we can turn our back on on stuff that's happened you know in, in longer term history uh, so you suggested putting the word better in front of a line where, what else would you like? What else would you I like? Suggest, I would suggest adding the word better at the beginning. I would suggest striking uh, what's in parentheses and adding um, while considering fishery infrastructure. Oh, while considering existing infrastructure and past fishery performance. All right, Kirby, are you getting that? Yes. Yeah, I'm getting that down and I'll be sure to return to these uh, proceedings to make sure we've got it's helpful. Okay. Thanks. All right. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Go ahead, Adam. Adam, we can't hear you. You're speaking. Hold on. Let me see, make sure he's not muted, Spud. You're self-muted, Adam. You're, you're still showing up as self-muted on our end, Adam. Maybe, Adam, if you can't, you can write us, text me, or put a note in the questions. I still have you as self-muted. I'll see you in the questions. Okay. Saying it won't let Adam unmute. Adam, why don't you log back and hang up and then call back in, and then we'll come back to you. So oh, I just got a note that I was unmuted by organizer and that allowed me to be unmuted. Okay, there you go. Uh, right, regardless, of, regardless of the technical challenges, thanks everyone for your help. Uh, my comments were going to be the same as Lynn's. I think she did a great job of capturing them. Uh, Lynn, if you count to 11 next time, I'll save you the trouble. Uh, but I share uh, Lynn's concerns and echo her recommendations. Thank you. Any other hands? Nicola Meserve and then Chris Fat Savage. All right, go ahead, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I also support Lynn's um, revisions there um, and wanted to, you know, note that we are using um, landings as a, as a proxy 
proxy for availability in, in the options that look at the allocations. And um, you know, the landings are really a product of availability as well as the effort, which is controlled by a number of factors. And while I'm, I'm not suggesting that the um, objective statement here needs to change, but it, I think it may be important somewhere within the addendum to to recognize that you know landings do not equal availability without considering some other factors as well, like effort. Thank you. All right. Good. Good point. Good point. All right, Chris, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just thinking about the uh, discussions we had about the statement of the problem, uh, looking at the second objective, um, should we replace the word directed with current uh, to make sure that we're kind of capturing the whole range of fisheries that are seen in the different states, or is this a little different issue than what we were talking about under the statement of the problem? Thanks. No, I think, I think uh, that's a good catch. I'll defer to Kirby if Perhaps uh, we're mixing mixing things here, but I, I think yeah, consistency between the statement of the problem, the objective, and describing that would be would be prudent. So uh, you're, we would be replacing the word directed in the second bullet with the current. So it would say ensure jurisdictions can maintain current fisheries with minimal interruptions during the season. You see any issue with that, Kirby? I mean, the only other consideration with this is you know. When we're talking about directed fisheries, we're talking about the state landing under their allocation. Um, and the previous, for the statement of the problem, people were referring to fisheries that are occurring times outside of the allocation, you know, either incidental catch, um, small scale fisheries. So that's just the main consideration is if, if there is interest in wanting for consistency between the two, I get it, that makes sense. but. What we're trying to address with allocation again in, in this section is, um, you know, those fisheries that are up being applied to the states, their light is being applied to the state's quota. So, so that's the distinction. Okay. Um, yeah, I can see where it might, yeah, might be a bit confusing, but, um, Um, anybody else got an opinion on this? This is sort of the predicament of wordsmithing things. I have Lynn and then Emerson. All right, go ahead, Lynn. I think it should, I think Chris is right. I think it should change. And, and I sort of understand this confusion about incidental versus directed, but the bottom line is right now that we don't know, you know, what is going to be the fate of all these different tools. And, and right now, those tools are in place in order to allow uh, these non-directed um, multi-species gears to continue fishing with minimal, minimal interruptions during the season. So I think, I think that is what we want to do um, for our fisheries and the tools that we use to get there, if it's these tools that sort of allow the allocation to, to flex up and down the coast during the course of the season, so be it. But I think the overall objective um, is is current fisheries. All right, thank you. All right, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, um, I agree with Lynn and Chris. Um, I think we need um, to change that. Um, you know, also under, for incidental catch, it's this incidental catch in small scale fisheries, right? So some of those small scale fisheries may at some times, I'm gonna say be directing on Menhaden because the catch that day just happened to have more Menhaden than other species, for instance, you know, um, on a pound net um, on a beach thing, for instance. So yeah, um, and, and, and in those cases it was, Landed under the incidental and small scale, but perhaps that's because the the state's quota allocation had been met. So, yeah, depending on what happens with small scale and incidental, we may want to uh, maintain what our current fisheries are, as, as I mentioned before in the statement of the problem. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, does anybody uh, 
have heartburn over replacing the word directed with current uh, in bullet number two. If so, speak now. Forever hold your peace. I don't see yeah. any. No hands, bud. All right, very good. Okay. Uh, any further comments on this objective slide? If not, we'll move on. About it, Tom. Move right. on. Okay, move on. All right, Kirby. Okay, so next, uh, we wanted to get the board's feedback on the plan development team recommendations. So in particular, the tiered approach, we need guidance on setting those tiers, clarify whether a pooled quota alternative should be pursued, um, get agreement from the board on whether to limit the number of weighted allocation options and not to include in the draft addendum uh, the, the following, a longer time series average, for allocating the tax, the second best year strategy, and the open fishery, and then reallocate um, alternatives. All right, I'll tell you, let's, uh, let's sort of work from the bottom up here. We've got um, the PDT has recommended that we not include uh, some, some alternatives in there. Um, is there anyone that uh, would like to speak in favor of keeping those in? If so, please raise your hand. Megan Ware has her hand up. All right, go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I would speak in favor of keeping the second best year strategy. And uh, at this point, my understanding is that a lot of that analysis has been completed. Um, so I, I would kind of hate for the board to throw out that option without actually seeing the numbers if the numbers have been done. So my suggestion would be that we see those numbers and if next board meeting, we don't like them, then we, we throw it out. But if the work's been done, I think it is prudent to at least look at those numbers. I think, you know, there was a comment earlier about effects of 2020 on landings. And I think that's why this option is attractive for me is that, you know, I do think that there were some states that had detrimental effects from COVID on their fisheries, and there were other states where that had no impact. Uh, but if we are using a more recent time series for allocation, those impacts are going to be incorporated uh, in, in, a, in a state's allocation. And you kind of get around that issue with a second best year strategy, where if a state did have detrimental COVID impacts, that likely wouldn't be their second best year of landings. So to me, I would keep that one in. All right, thank you. Uh, Kirby, uh, um, is what Megan said about the analysis uh, largely being done, is that, that uh, correct? I mean, it wouldn't be that burdensome at this point to leave this in? Yes, we, we've had a uh, PDT member before together, so we can flush that out for you. Okay, so we've. Uh, Got a voice in support of uh, keeping the second best year strategy in. Uh, anyone else supportive of the other two that uh, are under that last bullet on the slide? I have uh, Rob LaFrance. Go ahead, Rob. I just want to support Megan on this. I think um, I think she raises an interesting question here about what the second best years actually look like. And listening to some earlier conversations, maybe also helpful for us to understand what states really want based upon their second best year. So I think this is important for us to take a look at. All right, thanks Rob. Okay, uh, anybody just adamantly opposed to including that uh, at this point? If, if, if so, raise your hand. I don't have any hands, bud. All right, then we'll, we'll leave it on the list. All right, well, let's work our way uh, down from the top, uh, we've got the tiered approach, um, and we may have to, Kirby, we may have to bounce back to, to some of that other reference information as we talk about this. But uh, um, is everybody, how's everybody feel about that one in terms of, of leaving a tiered approach in? Uh, and if so, we need some feedback on setting the tiers. We've Lynn Bagley and then Megan Ware, and then Nicola. Oh, yeah. And then Nicola. 
And then Connor. Sorry. So Lynn, Megan, Nicola, Connor. All right. Sounds like Parker's family. All right. All right. Go ahead, Lynn. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I feel like I'm in a choose your own adventure novel here. Um, so I, I think uh, I would support leaving the tier in, but I would suggest that it be simplified and that um, there will only be two tiers and that there be a tier for the no harvest states. I think there's three of them and they get a tier of, of you know, the 10th of the 0.1% or less. And then everybody else gets that's an equivalent fixed minimum that's maybe between, you know, 0.3 and 0.4%. That would be my, my suggestion and not try to play the game of setting criteria to fit states into three tiers. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you, Leah. All right, Megan. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'd be interested to see what Lynn's approach uh, shows. I think, and I think one of the questions was, you know, what criteria do we use for this and or besides average landings and something that I would recommend considering if we stick with a three tier approach would be um, not just the average of landings, but the variability of those landings from year to year, because I think a state who is really consistent in their landings, they're going to have a different or feel a different impact of a lower fixed minimum than a state who maybe has a low average, but has quite a lot of variability in their landings. So I would uh, throw that out there for PET consideration. All right, thank you. Okay, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Megan kind of stole my thunder on um, the concern about using average landings and instead looking more at a, a distribution of the landings, um, at the frequency distribution of landings for the assigning the tiers. Um, and I'm, I'm also interested in, in what Lynn suggested, and it really highlighted for me that I think this tiered approach is the way that the board needs to be moving forward. Um, I don't think that there is a single um, fixed minimum that uh, is really going to achieve the objectives uh, that we've set uh, for ourselves here. And um, you know, I'd be I'd be willing to you know simplify the document by focusing on, on the fixed minimum approach as a, the tiered approach. Sorry, as opposed to just a single tier for all states that's different from the 0.5. All right. Thank you. And Connor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I guess I would just stress that, um, you know, for, for, you know, as a state that's primarily operating on the fixed minimum, I just wanted to, you know, stress that, you know, while reducing that may have benefits, I think it does, but to the, the at the coast wide level, I think it will make it challenging for some states to be able to maintain um, their current fishing, which um, I think is, you know, as we discussed, part of the objectives of the addendum to reflect current um, harvesting and uh, the availability of the fish. So I guess I would, I know there was discussion earlier about even going lower in options, and I guess if um, if there was going to be looking at percentages lower than what was presented by the PDT, I would also then suggest looking at even more of a gradient across the fixed tiers, uh, uh, across the minimum. And I, I guess just kind of um, stressing to the fact that um, with the with the minimums where they are now for fisheries that are operating off that um, significant reductions to that for an active fishery would have could have ramifications um, in their ability to operate at that 0.5 percent. It's all, you're already operating on a on a rather small small quota with an active fishery. So I just wanted to. Um, Stress that I, I understand the goals to try and um, try and reallocate where we can where there aren't active fisheries, but um, I just wanted to stress that um, a significant reduction could have could actually go against some of the goals of trying to maintain some of the active fisheries in the region. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, Kirby, have you you've got all this? Um, yeah, I'll just highlight, you know, part of what we're trying to get to with this memo is, is honestly trying to remove items 
that are not helpful and and further develop items that are. And what I, I'm hearing is an interest in further pursuing the tiered fixed minimum approach, but I heard two different approaches for that. I heard Lynn suggest the two tier, um, and I heard Megan and Nicholas suggest the three tier approach. And then I heard Connor offer up that additional um, you know, levels of, of you know, what that minimum is should be considered. And, and so I would just maybe reiterate to the board something that I, I started to talk about at our last meeting, and I think I'm going to be harping on over the next few board meetings, which is you know, I, you know, we want to make sure this document is addressing what you guys want it to and, and is providing all the, the options you're hoping for. But you know, do keep in mind what the benefit is in having you know these slight modifications to uh, alternatives that are being brought up. You know, is there is there true benefit in looking at you know those splices of a percentage? So um, I want to get clarity that we are to develop at least two alternatives that have different tiered approaches. One being two and the other being three. Um, but I would ask is if there's interest in pursuing more than that, you know, what the, the benefit of that is. And maybe the other point to bring up is, you know, Nicola, I think, had mentioned an interest in moving away from the uniform fixed minimum. Um, and if there is interest from other board members to pursue that and just focus on this tiered approach, you know, we can we can do that. All right, thanks. So let's let's address that question. You know, our, uh, we, we've got you know interest in this in this tiered approach. Um, what's what's the board's sense on you know basically going away as Kirby said, going away from the fixed minimum and going to this tiered approach in whatever form it may actually take place. And, and that's you know we we want to have some alternatives to. Uh, that'll be analyzed and we'll have to evaluate but is there is there a is there a strong i guess majority feeling of abandoning the fixed minimum uh in favor of this tiered approach and i'd like some, some feedback on that please i have uh justin dennis and then lynn all right go ahead justin Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, at the beginning of today's meeting, I was sort of ready to advocate for getting rid of the the option for a tiered approach and just leaving in the option for settling on one fixed minimum allocation. I, I think at this point, I've been swayed by the discussion that it's unlikely that we're able we're going to be able to find a, a single fixed minimum allocation that's going to sort of meet these competing goals of sort of freeing up latent quota but at the same time providing a minimum allocation that's large enough to allow you know states that are operating a fishery under that allocation to continue to do so so i think i've come around to favoring getting rid of the single fixed default minimum allocation approach in favor of a tiered approach but i really liked what Lynn suggested, I, I've sort of felt like trying to come up with a three-tiered approach for the minimum allocation is just trying to split things too fine and allocating too much effort into, you know, making a decision that ultimately may not have a lot of impact. Um, I, I kind of like the compromise of settling on a two-tiered approach where you have one tier for states that do not have a history of harvest and then another, you know, fixed minimum for states that do. So I think, you know, at this point, I'd be in favor of going with the tiered approach, but trying to keep it simple and maybe just having two tiers. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Justin. All right, Dennis. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. The question I would have for Kirby and for every, an answer would, might be enlightening for everyone else. And we, when we talk about the tiered approach, what percentage of the total TAC are we talking about percentage-wise? It seems to me that we're talking about dividing up crumbs, you know, fooling around with a tenth of a percent, one-tenth of one percent, and whatever numbers you want to attach to it doesn't seem to me to 
get us to the real problem. I, I think I can use Maine as an example as an example. They obviously have an availability of Menhaden and they have a need for Menhaden and therefore they should have a quota that goes along with that instead of you know the piecemeal approach that we're taking. So I and I can understand that the states do not want to give away some amount of their quota. We need a system that is more flexible in some way that allows, say, your state, but if it men hit and show up and there was a fishery to be had, you should have access to that fishery. And I don't think you want to re relinquish that. And that goes the same with any of the other states. The real, you know, gorilla in the room is the fact that there's one or two states that are two states will say that are now have allocated to them 85 to higher than that 87 percent of the total quota well we sit here and argue about how we're going to divide up the rem remainder the 12 percent between another dozen states the whole thing just doesn't make sense years ago when we came up with a half a percent as i recall to each state that was a compromise that was buying votes we we came up with that number so that people would find a number that they could support whether they were going to use it or not but that carried the day quite a few some some years ago so i don't know where we're going but i know that right now we're talking fighting over crumbs and we're not really being realistic in what the needs of the states are and their entitlement to a fish that lives in the ocean. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Dennis. Yeah, I think when we set those minimum quotas before, we sort of put ourselves on the, on the path to where we are now, which is, you know, we set expectations and now we're trying to reconcile uh, expectations to reality. So, uh, all right, Lynn, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. I'll just say, you know, we are fighting over crumbs, but they're they're incredibly important crumbs. So I think what two tiers does is it allows the states with no harvest access to the fish. If they have some bycatch or, you know, some occurrence, they will have access to the fish. And it does provide several percentage points back um, to divide up. And that fixed minimum does provide flexibility because it serves as a buffer if the fish arrive in your state and suddenly you have you know a few more fish than the allocation scheme would project you to have and like to connor's point this does allow uh, their fisheries to operate so you know i i think that i think that the tier the two tiers just takes takes that decision that was made for amendment three and and just makes it fine tunes it a little bit um, to be to be more appropriate for the state's needs. And in that second tier, that fixed minimum for the states who harvest, you know, there can be a range. It can go back up to 0.5 percent. You know, that that number I think is open for debate. But but I do think there's um, this idea of trying to divide it into three tiers is is, is going to be a, a difficult. Um, trying to explain that to the public and, and one more thing to frankly fight over. All right. Thank you, Leah. So, so we've had, you know, some, some discussion and advocating for narrowing it down to one, one tier for further consideration. Uh, so, um, I guess Kirby, that would be helpful. I assume if, if, if that's the will of the board to narrow it down to that. I mean, I've heard an interest in moving forward with at least uh, a two-tier and, and then obviously a three-tier. Um, to Dennis's earlier question, 8% of the TAC is uh, you know, tied up in this fixed minimum approach. So what would be helpful is if there is interest in pursuing this tiered approach, then I, I would like to get confirmation that we would drop out the kind of the uniform fixed minimum uh, approach that is also in the memo because uh, that um, i want the board to be conscious of the the universe of alternatives that are 
potentially going to be drafted up further if, if you know you're kind of adding more things in but not really removing anything. All right, so yeah, back to that to that question that I asked. I mean, are we? Is there anyone that is feels strongly that we need to continue that fixed minimum alternative? I have Justin Davis with his hand up. Go ahead, Justin. I apologize. That was from before I left my hand up. All right. All right any yeah. other hands? No hands. All right, Kirby, I'm going to take that as the, the will of the board is to, is to delete that from further consideration and to focus on the, the tiered approach. Okay. Got that noted. Um, and then, uh, so I have, you know, based off of feedback from Lynn, Nicola, and Megan, um, I have some guidance on generally where to try to draft those tiers up. The other question for the board is whether to continue having a pool of quota alternative in this uh, addendum moving forward. And the other question for allocation that's key is limiting the number of weighted allocation approaches. All right, so let's take the uh, pool quota alternative first. Is there uh, interest in, in further pursuing that one as an alternative? I know there's a lot of questions that arise out of that. I mean, I, just as one of the states that were included in that uh, scenario, you know, I, you know, we have to have agreement amongst ourselves if, if one of those states wanted to harvest menhaden we all have to agree and then if we wanted to do a transfer we would have to do an agreement on a transfer out of our pool quota so there's some the devils in the details but uh but i'm certainly at this point neutral on it but i'd like some feedback from the board i have joe Semino, mel bell and then richie white all right, go ahead, Joe. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Only fitting my hand was up first. I kind of brought this uh, to the PDT through the work group. Um, I, you know, PDT didn't have much time uh, to get us all of this information that they have provided, and uh, I think you have a lot of questions for good reason. This is a, this was a thought process that that we really aren't there yet, and I don't think needs to be a part of this. Uh, you know, maybe sometime in the future, it's a discussion. We're supposed to look at reallocation every three years, but I feel comfortable with having it dropped at this time. Thanks. All right, thanks, Joe. All right, Mel. Yeah, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, you know, originally thought that was kind of an interesting concept, but then kind of like Joe was saying, I got to thinking about it, and it, it seems like it could be kind of administratively burdensome and a little more complicated. And if uh, at this point, I think we can find something to live um, under. Uh, by, and go ahead and just delete that one, um, set it aside. But um, first, it had some appeal, but then had to thinking that the devil's in the details, and there's probably too many details to deal with. All right, thanks, Mel. All right, Lisa. Um, I agree. Uh, should be taken out. Uh, too many uh, potential issues that I can see. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Richard. Any uh, comments uh, in support of keeping it in? I'm not sure if they're in support, but David Borden has his hand up. And uh, then go ahead, David. Sheree Patterson also. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I agree with all three of the prior speakers. I just see this as a administrative burden and nightmare for the state agencies. So. Uh, I I concur it should be taken out. Thank you, David. Three. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I also agree pool quota uh, should not be considered for this particular scenario or this particular species. We do this in the Northeast with uh, dogfish, and it is uh, an administrative burden. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Sounds like the general consensus of the board is to have it removed, Kirby. 
Okay, I've got that noted. Thank you. All right. Next one uh, might be a little more complicated, and that is to, how, how would we how would we like to limit the the number of weighted allocation options if they are going to stay in? Um, you know, in the scenario that was presented in the in the progress reports, you've got you know 50, 50, 75, 25, 25, 75, depending on the different time series and that, this one I know is can be difficult to sort out uh, so I expect there might be some questions on you know, what choosing one means over another so I'll open it up for that I don't have any hands so far <laughs> all right Megan Ware. Megan Ware and then well, Sheree followed by Cherie. Uh, go ahead, Megan. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I, I guess maybe I'll start with the time frames, Kirby, because it looks like you have three combinations of time frames uh, for the weighted approach. Um, and looking across those three, kind of where I'm seeing the shifts in quota is Maine, Mass, New Jersey, and Maryland. So my, I think we can, or I hope we can pair it down to two and kind of my goal in pairing it down to do to two is just preserving the range that each of the states has. Um, if they have like a higher value and a lower value, making sure that those try and stay in. So I, I think we can accomplish that with the first two uh, allocation time periods, which means removing the 10 to 12, 18 to 20 uh, option. And then in terms of the 50, 50, 75, 25, I I struggle to see how a 75 25 or 75 is on the historic data. I I'm struggling to see how that's going to create enough delta of a difference for the New England state states. So I would recommend removing that. Or one more time on which of the way to remove. I think that it's the very uh, furthest right one. Yeah, yeah, I've got the, the 10, 2010, 2012, 2018 to 2020, but in terms of the um, the weighting 50, 50, oh. 70. Uh, 70, one of the 75, 25, where the 75 is on the more historic set of years. Does that make sense? So remove that one and leave in the 50, 50 and the 25, 75, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Uh, we, we, we did more towards recent landings that way. I've got you. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks, Megan. All right, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with Megan. I think we need to go with um, the more recent time series. If if our objective is to uh, address quota where the fish are. And I think we need to stay with the uh, closer time series to, to recent. And I agree with uh, what Megan had indicated. Thank you. All right, thank you, Sheree. All right, Kirby, just to make sure everybody's uh, clear on what those recommendations are, if you just restate them, the, the two, two time series, and we, we, can, we know it's 50 50 or 25 75. Time series that have been recommended. Yeah, just give me a minute so I can pull it up so people can see what we're talking yeah. about. I think it might Good. be helpful. Yes. Um, I, while he's doing that, I'll just let you know that Steve Bowman, followed by Pat Deer, have their hands up. Sorry, two people, from Virginia, two people from Virginia can't talk at the same time. I'm sorry, not seriously. All right. Go ahead, Steve. While he's got that up, Mr. Chairman, this is Pat here. I'm going to speak. I'm going to speak on behalf of uh, Steve Bowman. Um, All right, go ahead, Pat. We would disagree with the 75-25 split. We think it should be equally split, uh, simply because we've already talked about, as Nicholas said earlier, landings do not indicate availability, and you know we need we have you know we need to uh, address those historical values as well. There's infrastructure in place. Um, and doing anything less than a 50-50 split would be 
um, something that we could not support. We do support those years of uh, nine, you know, 2009 through 2011. Those are years before um, there, were, there, there was attack in place, and we realized you know, using the most recent years are, are, are important as well. So uh, we support the years. Uh, we just don't support anything anything other than the 50-50 split. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Okay. All right, so Kirby's got up the time frames. All right, so we'll go ahead, Kirby, just to make sure everybody knows what they're looking at here. Sure. Um, so, again, what I uh, got guidance on from Megan was removing when it came to the weighted approach, um, removing the last one. Uh, the last column, which was 2010 through 2012 and 2018 through 2020, uh, as that falls in the middle of the, the two others. Um, I also got, you know, preference noted from her to the way towards more recent landings. So uh, 25, 75 split. Um, I, I just heard from Pat Gear an interest in having a version that has a 50-50 split on that. Um, and then what I wanted to make sure I, I had correct was, you know, one of the recommendations from the plan development team was that if there is an interest in using these weighted um, time frames, you know, these are right ones, that in turn the using a time frame of 2009 to 2020 would would not be uh, needed as it, it produces similar uh, types of percentages. So if there is agreement to want to pursue a weighted time frame approach, then I wanted to get confirmation that there are board members in agreement to, to not have a 2009 through 2020 time frame um, alternative in the document. All right, is there any concern about what Kirby's just uh, described? Uh, or there is there a need for clarifying questions on that? I have. Uh, you're talking about I'm Lynn Bagley and Pat here and Steve Bowman. Okay, uh, go ahead, Lynn. Okay, so I think Kirby just helped me out. Somehow I was under the impression that we had already sort of agreed by consensus to remove the 2009-2020 option, but that doesn't seem true. Seems like that's still in there. So I would say to um, Megan's point and to Pat's point, if we are maintaining options in the document, like the 2018 to 2020 reference period, there is no need, I don't think, to go to the weighted time period that weights heavily toward the recent years. I would rather replace that with keeping the long time period or using the 50-50 that produces similar results. So I think as long as we have these options that have th these recent time frames, we need to remember that we put in our objectives that we wanted to better align and we still wanna consider infrastructure and past fishery performance. And to Nicola's point that landings are more than just availability. You know, they're about what a, what a state's doing with its effort. So I, I think if we don't do the 75 weights to recent years, maintain the recent year time frame, and maintain that long average, we're going to have a coverage of all of those interests. And I hope I articulated that okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to follow that. I'm a little fuzzy uh, exactly where where what this table would look like under that scenario but maybe kirby you can you can help unfuzz this for me um i think I'm, i got confused by what lynn is looking for we were moving forward with getting this uh the far column removed and i was trying to get confirmation that and having a weighted approach in this document that there wouldn't be the need for the full 2009 to 2020 time frame. Lynn just spoke in favor of keeping that in. Um, so I would like to, to better understand, you know, 
if there is agreement with other board members to keep in 2009 to 2020. Um, if that is something that you guys want to add as an explicit time frame option, that would be helpful. Uh, thanks. Lynn, would you can you follow up maybe and help us get out of this little fog we're in here? Yeah, I'm sorry. I certainly didn't mean to create that. So I agree right. that that last column to the right could be removed. I'm trying to agree with what Pat Gear said that anything weighted more than 50 50 to recent years it i would not support and i was trying to say that if there is an option that provides similar results to that long time series then that long time series i would support removing Yeah, and I think this is the inherent problem of, of two dimensional steps here. Is we're we're trying to reconcile waiting to time series. Um trying to figure out a way to extricate ourselves out of this you know, tug of war we've got going on between waiting and, and time series. Um well I think in the interest of time, um we will leave this in. Um, what I've heard is an interest in two different variations on the weighted approach, 50-50 and 25-75. Um, you know, there are a, a, a number of other items I want to get to in this document, and I just I'm going to reiterate that if you guys don't want to remove things now, I, I understand, but there will come a point in which to simplify the addendum, things will need to be removed. So. All right, uh, Pat, sorry I left you hanging there. Thank you, Chair, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just wanted to clarify, um, I'm, not, I'm not opposed to keeping all three options to go forward into the, into the plan. I, I just didn't want it to just be one or the other. I think, you know, all three options, the 2575, the 7525, and the 5050. Um, okay, with all three of those moving forward. Thank you, Pat. Now, was Steve going to talk, or were you talking to Christine? No, no, sir. We're just having a little difficulty as far as technical stuff as you're concerned, but uh, we'll, we'll get broadband here before it's over with. Thank you. I remember y'all saying y'all were pooled together in there, so so thank you, Steve. No problem whatsoever. All right, Kirby. So are we good on that slide? can't remember. Yes, I'm just going to bring back to, I think, some of the time frame questions that we were hoping to get um, some clarity on from the board. Um, so let me just pull up the, um, sorry. Some of the other questions that were important to try to get answered was we we had a moving average method in this document as well and so i wanted to get confirmation from the board that there is an interest in keeping that alternative in the addendum all right thanks yeah that one yeah that one i think is is interesting in concept it may be good or bad in execution so i'll, I'll Invite comment on that. Uh, work. Connor McManus. All right, go ahead, Connor. Uh, thank you, Mr. Terry. Um, I, I would be in favor of, of keeping that in. I think in thinking about the issue at hand and the objectives of the addendum, it really tries to get towards you know what is the what are the landings distributed to date, um, and also allow for a dynamic nature of, of, of the states in terms of their ability either to harvest or just in terms of where um, landings are occurring. Um, I, th I think it is worth noting, especially as the PT noted that there in that example figure towards the end, you know, there are these, there, there can be somewhat of a cyclical nature in terms of where landings happen and where the resources. So I think this is probably one of the more adaptive and responsive tools to, towards um, addressing that 
that thought. So I would be interested in seeing it move forward, um, primarily in the spirit of uh, the objectives of the addendum. Uh, any other hands, Tony? No other hands. All right, perfect. So at least we have uh, one person in favor of keeping it in there. Is anybody, uh, you know, want to register their concerns about leaving it in there? Or are you fine with leaving it in? If you're opposed, let me know. Just raise your hand. If Emerson has Brooke. All right, go ahead, Emerson. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I've kind of lost my place here. So, which of these bullets are we discussing right now about leaving in or taking out? At the bottom, leave, leaving in the moving average method. Okay, I'm not opposed to that. I mean, uh, I'm not. A, <laughs> yeah, I'm not opposed to keeping it in. I know this is this is a lot to keep straight in your head. I, I know. I understand. It's it's uh, difficult. It's in a virtual environment. So thank you, Emerson. All right, Kirby. I think you've heard from the board on that one. Yep. Um, so I think we've addressed most of the the main questions for allocation, and I think in the interest of time, it'd be good to get board feedback on the incidental catch and small scale fisheries. All right. Okay. All right. Um, let's see here, we have the state. Mr. Chair. Yes. I'm sorry, this is Lynn Fegley. I just, I wanted to just throw out there about removing the, um, Reopen for three years and then reallocate. I think that's in the allocation. Uh, can you take us back to that, Kirby? Yes, I was not having heard any agreement from the board to keep it in. I, I it would be good to get confirmation to remove this. Which one are we looking at? Remind me. I kind of got lost there in the track. Say, say what you said again, Lynn. Yeah, I'm sorry. It was the open fishery then reallocate. I wanted to make sure there was a consensus to remove that. Yeah, that one's gone. Okay. Apologies. No problem. No problem. All right, Kirby, take us back. All right, we have a statement of problem here under incidental catch. Um, so I'd like some board feedback on the language here. Um, Lynn, is your hand up for this or was that from before? That was from before, sorry. No worries. Uh, Richie White. All right, go ahead, Richie. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, <clears throat> uh, as I said uh, initially, uh, I guess I can't support changing this until I see volume, the quotas that the New England states will get, because now they depend on this. Um, so cutting this back substantially uh, <clears throat> would have some severe implications if um they do not have adequate quotas up front so so that that would be my sense we got to see what the other end is before you make a decision here thanks i guess my, my question is do, do do you agree that this this language adequately describes the problem that we're having to address in the addendum uh, uh, yes i yes it, it is a problem absolutely thank you sorry that's all right. all right. No problem. Okay. Very good. All right. Any other hands? We have Justin Davis followed by Lynn Fagley. All right. Go ahead, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to offer that I thought the second to last bullet here, the one that starts with Amendment 3 language, um, isn't maybe as clear as it could be, particularly the sub bullet underneath it. Um, Maybe I'm the only one who feels that way, but I thought maybe a little.
little bit of clarification there of what exactly is being communicated uh, could be helpful. Okay, let's see here. I'm going to look at the the actual. This is obviously bulleted. The um, statement of the problem in the actual memo is is much much more detailed. Um, so maybe if you could look at that and see whether or not you still have the same concerns. As it says, the amendment three language has led to various interpretations of which landings fall under this provision. Uh, if, it, if it needs to be further expanded, that's fine. Justin, we can work on um, perfecting this, but the, the issue that the PDT was trying to highlight here is that you've got some states that start to land under the incidental catch provision before their full jurisdiction's allocation is met. So they do it based off of a sector or a gear having met their subdivided jurisdictional allocation. And it's been flagged by the plan review team and the FMP review in recent years. Thanks, Kirby. And I, I do see that the language in the actual memo document is much more descriptive. So I would retract my uh, my earlier statement. Thanks. No problem. No problem. I'm just uh, trying to make sure the bullets capture the essence of it. But sometimes that means losing some of the uh, the detail. So, all right, Lynn, you're next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just add to the intent that the other part of this uh, was to minimize regulatory discards for non-directed multi-species fisheries. Okay, so you want to add that uh, as an additional sentence under the intent statement, is that correct? Correct. Okay, you got that, Kirby? Yes. All right, very good. All right, any further comments on the statement of the problem? With Emerson Hasbrook and Rob LaFrance. Right, go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, relative to the last bullet there, without changes to these landings, and by these landings, I think we're talking about incidental catch and small scale fisheries overall. Without changes to these landings, without changes, these landings may remain at high levels are increased. This could jeopardize management objectives. I, I'm, I'm not completely following how the incidental catch of small scale fisheries landings can jeopardize our management objectives. Can somebody help explain that to me, please? I'll take a shot at it. I think the concern is that at, at the rate they're increasing, as you see in that third bullet, they've exceeded the state quotas range to one four percent of the annual tax. Since they don't get counted against the tax, if, if we reallocate in order to fully utilize the tax, then the I think an unintended consequence could be that the incidental pitches cause a uh, chronic exceedance of the tax, which then means that we're removing more Menhaden from the water than we intend to do under uh, our management approach. So is Kirby, is that a accurate description or I'm off? No, you're correct. A follow up on that, please. Go oh, ahead. Yeah. Um, but if if our intent here is to change the underlying allocations to each state, then hopefully we're not going to have to, or hopefully states are not going to revert to the incidental catch and small scale fisheries allocation because their quota is still open. Right now, if you've got a small quota, then you start going against the incidental catch quicker. But if you've got a larger quota, then you're not going to start fishing against the incidental catch um, as early on. In, in the year. So I, I don't know that that's going to jeopardize our management objective. It kind of depends on how things shake out with with our reallocation. Well, I think that's that's what uh, I guess the statement without changes, if things were to stay at status quo and we did not have 
uh, a change in you know the way that the incidental catch provision is being currently utilized, and we it could result in you know exceedance of the tax overall. But I think if, if you can, you know, it's been stated multiple times this afternoon that all these things are connected together. It's kind of hard to touch one without touching the other ones and understanding what that means for the first one, and that, and that is part of the inherent problem in, in these sort of situations. I, I certainly understand the concerns. So, uh, okay, uh, Rob, go ahead. This is really just a question for Kirby under the Amendment 3 language that we're talking about in terms of different interpretations. So is it, is it well, what you're looking for is clarification that we need to make certain that either one gear type is, in other words, you, you exceed the quota for the whole of your state before you can get into this program versus exceeding it for a particular gear type? Is that, I just want to make certain that that's the question. So the statement of the problem, again, is trying to outline the issues that need to be addressed. Um, so the next slide is going to go over the objectives. In terms of ways of addressing this, the plan development team has put forward an alternative to make the language more clear on whether a jurisdiction can go into incidental catch, um, you know, whether it's They've met their their full allocation or subdivided sector year specific allocation. Thank you, Kirby. You answered my question. I appreciate it. All right. Um, any further questions or comments about this statement of the problem? Anything that we just find unacceptable and needs to be changed? We need we need to move on. We're running out of time. No other hands. All right. Okay, Kirby, let's move on to the objective slide. So, again, we're trying to make sure that the board feels that this objective statement or this objective will address the statement of the problem. All right. Uh, I'm just going to bring this up. Because it's come up in earlier discussions, and that is uh, under bullet one, it says meeting the needs of existing fisheries. Do we want that to be changed to current, or does is existing a suitable synonym for current? I'll throw that out there and then just open it up for, for general questions and comments. You have Megan Ware. Right, go ahead, Megan. Uh, to answer your question, Mr. Chair, I think existing is a fine synonym for current, so I'm fine with existing. Um, I think they mean the same thing. Um, I had a couple concerns with these, and I think my overarching concern is that I felt like some of these objectives veered into actual management tools as opposed to objectives. So, for example, number four, establishing trip limits and season limits. That's something we're considering in this document, and I think we should consider but to me, that, that's a management tool to achieve an objective, not necessarily an objective. Um, similarly, number three, like uh, indicating when landings can occur, I, I agree we need to answer that, and that those landings are not part of the directed fishery. To me, that's giving, uh, that's, a, that's like a management tool. I think that's what we're trying to answer the question to, right? Like, so I, I really think it's indicating when landings occur, and if, those landings are not a part of the directed fishery, right? And we we develop a range of alternatives to answer these different objectives. Um, my final comment on number two, so I fully support an objective about reducing discards. As Lynn mentioned previously, I think that is a really important part of this provision. I'm not actually sure limiting eligible gear types achieves that objective, and I'm not opposed to alternatives in the document that limit gear types, because I can sense that there's a strong desire for those. But I actually think on the, the one extreme, if you limit gear types all the way, then you would actually be increasing discards. So to me, there was a bit of a mismatch there between or in the number two objective, and my recommendation would be just to simply say reduce discards as number two. 
All right, thank you. Those good, good comments. I think sometimes we do we've got to blur the line between objectives and actionable items pursuant to objectives. So we've got a, a recommendation that we would modify bullet two uh, to only include reducing discard mortality and then actually remove uh, bullet three and bullet four uh, based on Megan's comments. So uh, further comments from the board, questions? Mr. Chair, just to clarify, if I may, on number three, um, I don't think it needs to be removed necessarily, although it can be. I think if we keep it in, it, it should just st state indicating when landings can occur and if those landings are a part of the directed fishery. So pose it more as a question than a directive. Okay. All right. Thank you for clearing it up for me. We've had some suggested modifications from Megan. Any other raised hands, Tony? Sorry, Nicola Meserve, talking to myself. Go ahead, Nicola. Thank you. Um, I, I'm struggling a little bit with the first one, actually, to meet the needs of existing fisheries. Um, if that was the overall objective, I don't think we would have an option that would consider removing persons from the the allowance because that's certainly not going to meet the need of of, of that fishery. Um, so I I just don't know if that is there as as the objective is to constrain the landings um, while continuing to minimize discards. Um, I, I I see those two, but I don't know if we're trying to meet the needs of existing all the existing fisheries um, under this, under the incidental catch provision. All right. Well, um, do you recommend that statement be removed or modified? Uh, I think, I mean, thinking on the fly a little bit, um, I would say remove it. But it, maybe right. the, the PDT may be able to, you know, put some more thought into this one and come back at the next meeting, taking into consideration a lot of board comments today. All right, thank you. Yeah, I think one of the challenges with this is that we almost have to get in a time machine and go back to whenever we had the original discussions about the incidental fish provisions and what the purpose of that was. And um, I think one of the primary purposes of that provision was to just reduce discards, period. Um, I'd certainly lean on folks that were there back in those years. Um, if, if that's what the real objective of the incidental catch provision is, or is it grown to much more than that over time? I welcome comments about that. Excuse me, Lynn Fagley, and then yeah, Emerson, and then Emerson Hasbro. Yeah, thanks, uh -huh. Mr. Chair. As being, I think one of the architects of this Hakamimi idea, <laughs> um, the intent of this provision originally was to allow low volume, non-directed, multi-species gears a mechanism to continue working without creating large amounts of menhaden discards or having to shut down an entire multi-species fishery to preserve menhaden. That, that is, those were the conversations that we were having during amendment two. All right. Okay. So uh, uh, go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, similar to what Lynn just said, as I recall our discussion, however many years ago on this, was to have this allocation for not just an incidental catch, um, which to me is when somebody's fishing for something else, they they catch some menhaden. Um, not to have just uh, an allocation for incidental catch, but also small scale fisheries. Um, and I don't recall what we how we define small scale fisheries, but I, I'm, I'm sure that we did. Even if that small scale fishery caught more menhaden than it did other species, it was still a small scale fishery. So I, I think 
the discussion and the allocation here was for both, for both to allow an incidental catch and to allow small scale fisheries um, to harvest Medway. Thank you. All right, Kirby, could you back up to the statement of the problem again? I think maybe some of our difficulties kind of reconciling the objectives that are stated here to the statement of the problem. So really what we've got is, is, is a set of objectives that need to be pursuant to the problem as described here with the additions that were offered earlier. We really aren't. We really aren't talking about the objectives of the incidental catch provision per se. We're talking about the objectives to deal with this problem. I think that may be a little bit of our issue here. Kirby, you got any suggestions to lead us out of this situation we're in right here? Um. Yeah. So. I've gotten feedback to remove this fourth bullet to possibly work with the the plan development team with either modifying this first bullet or this this first item um, or removing it. I might need to go to Nicola for some more clarity on that. Um, I've gotten some language on adjusting the the third um, item as well. Uh, but you know, if if there aren't any other comments that people have on this, that's fine. We can move on to the recommendations and key questions. Okay. Do we have any raised hands, Tony? One, Steve Bowman. All right, go ahead, Steve. Shan Sh Shanna Madsen to be speaking. Go ahead, Shanna. Right, go ahead, Hi. Shanna. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry about us all being in the same room. I think it gets a bit confusing, but um, just kind of wanted to speak to both what Lynn had said and uh, what Emerson had brought up. And, and going back and just as full, uh, just to let everybody know, I am serving on the PDP currently. Um, so I just wanted to kind of disclose that. Um, I did go back when we were sort of developing some of these options and read through uh, the draft amendments for Amendment 2 and Amendment 3. Um, I did want to note that I think that, you know, there's, there's discrepancy sort of between what Amendment 2 had discussed as what an incidental catch by catch looks like and kind of what we put forward in Amendment 3. Like Emerson was saying, you know, that sort of enclosed a more small scale fisheries to be included as well as that incidental catch provision. However, I would note that in Amendment 3, we say very specifically that should a specific gear type show a significant increase in landings under that incidental catch provision, or it becomes clear that a non-directed gear type is directing on Menhaden under the incidental catch provision, the board has the authority through adaptive management to alter the trip limit or remove that gear from the incidental catch provision. So I think that kind of leads to some of the thoughts that we're trying to put forward to with this objective um, is with the incidental catch program. I think that you know, I've heard a lot from board members um, as far as whether or not they want that to actually encompass the small scale fisheries as well as incidental catch, or if we just want to go back to bycatch incidental catch provision like we had in Amendment 2. Um, I just kind of wanted to bring up that that was discussed in the draft Amendment 3. Thank you, Shanna. That's, that's, that's helpful context, I think, for, for us as we sort of you know, wander our way through all of this. So I, I think we're going to leave this for right now uh, uh, and move on to the next uh, slide, Kirby. Um, okay, so in terms of recommendations from the PDT, it was to adjust the trip limit, uh, whether that is the priority uh, because as noted, just adjusting the trip limit may not significantly reduce landings under the incidental catch and small scale fisheries provision. And the other was not to include catch accounting as this appears to be achievable in terms of addressing the, the concerns raised um, about increasing landings under this category uh, through either reallocation um, or could be 
address through changing gear types that are in uh, the, uh, the, the current provision, as well as trip restrictions. All right. So, um, is the board interested in, in continuing to have uh, trip limit adjustments in this addendum? Or to leave them just where they are and focused on the other uh, perhaps more important issues. You have Megan Ware, uh, Megan Ware, then Joe Cimino. All right, go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would recommend that we keep this in, and I guess I would kind of disagree with the PDT's conclusion that changes to trip limits may not significantly reduce landings. When I read the memo, it says 60% of trips were above 3,000 pounds. So if we went down to 3,000 pounds, 60% of trips would be impacted, which to me suggests that it would significantly reduce landings. Um, and, and just knowing what Maine's kind of distribution of trip limits looks like, um, I know it would significantly impact, have, have significant impacts in Maine, which is kind of the reason we're having this conversation. So I would recommend keeping it in. I do recommend, you know, I think the I think the change in trip limit has to be for directed gears. I know there are states in the mid-Atlantic where they have stationary multi-species gears that are reliant on that 6,000 pound, 12,000 pound uh, trip limit. So I, I think that the change in trip limit needs to be narrowed just to directed gear types. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I'm I'm okay with everything Megan said. I I, I think um, you know if we do want to have discussions on trip limits, eventually it'll be important to get public comment on that. Um, as for the catch accounting, I think it's important to revisit at some point in time, but I do not think it needs to be in this addendum. Um, I think as of right now. Um, you know, it's something that we are we are operating well within our our uh, safe harvest limits. Um, I, I I don't enjoy having any catch that isn't accounted for under a total allowable catch. And I, I spent some time thinking about this. I just I don't think this is an issue that we need to try and tackle right now with all the other stuff we're looking at. Thanks. All right, thank you, Joe. Um, is anyone strongly opposed to leaving in the, the trip limit element of the addendum? And likewise, is anybody? Excuse He's me, Tony, not, go ahead. Uh, Max has his hand up in opposition, I think. All right, so Max, you want to? Uh, sorry, Mr. Kinner. <laughs> um, no, I, was, I wasn't putting my hand up in the queue for opposition of the trip limit, but I did want to speak to the uh, the second bullet. So um, I can hold on to that comment. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I, I appreciate what um, Joe was saying, but I do kind of think this concept should stay in the document, at least for scoping. Um, and I, I also, I think I'm following what the PDT is thinking here that, um, if we get reallocation right, then reliance on the incidental catch provision um, will go down, and so those landings will be sort of minimal. But I do think the concept of ensuring all landings are counting towards the tax should should be part of this draft document for for scoping. So I'd like to see that in there. Okay. All right. Uh, so we've got a, uh, support for keeping. Go ahead, Tony. Now you have, um, I think the order that they came up was Allison, Colden, Lynn Fagley, Rob LaFrance, and then Justin Davis. Uh, go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to weigh in and support Max's comments about catch accounting. I think it's an important um, concept to keep in the document at this point. We've talked a lot um, throughout this afternoon about how incidental catch is increasing over time. It's not counted towards the tax. 
and I know our intention here with our reallocation efforts are to uh, move more of these landings into the directed fishery under the state by state allocation. But since we are at a point where we don't yet know how other parts of this management document are going to shake out and what that means for final allocations for the state by state. I think it's important that we keep this um, in here. I do think, you know, there may be some more flexible options that could be considered. I know the PDT has put a lot of time into thinking about this and, and you know, concerns that they might have, but, um, you know, at least making sure that if, the inclusion of the incidental catch uh, results in an overage of the coastwide tack that there is a management trigger um, that is tripped and we have to take action and treat it just like an overage in any other portion, either the EESA or the state by state allocations. I think that would be appropriate. And like Max said, I would support keeping this in the document at this point. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Allison. All right, Leah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Maybe being somewhat at odds um, with my colleague in my delegation, I, you know, I, I agree with um, the importance of of accountable catch, and I I really am starting to dislike this idea that these this harvest is being characterized as unaccountable. Um, because it is, a, I mean, we do account for it. We know exactly what we're catching. Um, we do compare the total harvest that includes incidental catch to the TAC each year. And the numbers are included in the stock assessment. I mean, those numbers are, are accounted for. My concern is that the options, you know, that we have in the document are extremely complicated. And I will say honestly that one of the saving graces of the incidental catch is is the administrative burden, you know, on the state. I think Maryland would wind up paying more than the Maryland Menhaden fishery is worth um, in in staff resources that we don't have um, to meet some of the monitoring requirements. Um, but that said, by the end of the year, you know, we are fully accounting. So I just, I feel like the public's going to be confused. It's going to be difficult to implement. I'd rather replace it with even language that says something like, you know, if we, ex if we do exceed the tax, we've never lost our way with where we were, with where we are in the annual harvest versus the tax. So maybe we just say, if we exceed the tax in a year, then the board has to take some sort of action. The problem that we have is the growth. It's the sort of big growth that's happening in this sector, you know, that, that's coming from that, from that person. So I think the problem, we need to fix the problem um, and not just throw the whole, um, you know, uh, baby into a different dimension. So I, I really think it's, it's for another, it's another conversation for another day. We have not exceeded the tax since this thing's been in place. All right, thank you, Lynn. All right, Rob. I just want to align my comments with Allison um, and just also say a couple things in terms of we keep referring to incidental catch, and I thought um, I thought I think it's important to recognize that it's not just incidental catch; it's incidental catch and small-scale fishery. And it's really that small scale fishery that we're really trying to make certain gets accounted for under the TAC. I understand that we look at it and we, it's part of the projections, but actually accounting for it and making certain it's accounted for like any other directed fishery should be what we're looking at, which is why I think we should maintain it um, in this particular document at this time. We still don't know how this is all gonna shake out. I think at the end of the day, we wanna make certain we leave this in here to make certain that we are accounting for the small scale fishery in how we look at the uh, how we look at the reported data as it relates to the tech. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Rob. All right, Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll, I'll keep it brief because a lot of good points have been made on both sides of this. I, I am in favor of keeping this in the document at this time. Um, I am fairly optimistic that when everything's said and done, um, the, the need for this won't be there anymore through 
you know, a combination of reallocation and some adjustments to this program that will, you know, negate the conditions that have led to the growth in cash under this category. Um, but for me at this point, I'd, I'd prefer to see it stay in. All right. Thanks, Justin. Any more, any more hands? One more hand, Emerson Hasbrook. All right, go ahead, Emerson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think some of the issue here is semantics, right? So um, the second bullet says not include cash accounting in the draft addendum. And even in the draft addendum, um, the category is cash accounting, but what it really speaks to is accountability. So we already are accounting for um, the incidental catch. As Lynn said, we, we know what it is, um, and, and we compare it, or we add it to the, to the landings and compare it against the tax. So we, 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 we account for those landings, right? But I think the issue is, what are we going to do about accountability, right? If, uh, if the incidental catch um, increases by whatever we might come up with here. I'm just, I just noticed that the slide changed here, a catch cap and, and so forth. So um, I, I think if we're going to go forward here, I think we need to change the, the, the category here to accountability rather than accounting, unless I've got it backwards. All right. Thanks, Emerson. Um, well, we're obviously there's split opinions on this one. Um, I guess I, I would recommend that we, we leave it in, but um, we'll have another chance to, to address this. Um, but Kirby could use a little bit of guidance on these alternatives here. Uh, this, so let, let's let's take a little little time here and and um, or even those that would like to see it go away. Maybe help Kirby out here. Kirby certainly weigh in on what, what we need to do to help you and the PVP with regard to these. Yeah, thanks, Bud. So I think one of the tough things is a key question this board continues to wrestle with is, you know, given the trend in landings, does the board want to continue having this provision be an incidental catch only provision or to uh, continue allowing directed small-scale fisheries under it. Um, if it's to allow directed small-scale fisheries, would the board rather constrain landings um, and not count them against the TAC, or to constrain landings, uh, or, or not constrain landings, but have them count against the TAC? And in trying to get at that, you know, the plan development team thought through at least a couple of alternatives to, to address this. Uh, but to the point raised earlier about complexity, without the board providing some kind of guidance on what the priority is, uh, this is going to be, frankly, a monster to try to you know, explain to the public. You've got at least two different approaches. You either have a, a set aside or you take a um, percentage of the tax that you're monitoring and then have a, you know, a, a management trigger too. So those are two different alternatives. Um, but then it could be further subdivided into being just specific to small scale directed gear types um, or for both. So again, the board, I think, is going to need to, if not today, uh, down the road, make a decision on what the priority is when it comes to accounting for this incidental catch uh, landings if they want to have this type of uh, program in place. Okay, thanks, Kirby. The, the day is getting long, and I think we're all getting a little fatigued in our brains, especially to deal with things this, um, this nuanced. Um, I certainly don't want us to make decisions that we're not comfortable with. Is there any strong feelings about these alternatives here? Um, or does Kirby's comments change anybody's opinion regarding whether we, we need to keep this in the addendum or, or we um, 
putting in something that's going to be very difficult for us and the public to to understand the consequences of. So I'll I'll throw that out. We're we're about to bump up against our time, and so we don't want to go any farther than we have to. So I want to keep this discussion going. You have Allison Colden followed by Lynn. All right, go ahead, Allison. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and hopefully what I'm offering is um, a, a helpful suggestion. I was just thinking um, as maybe an option to simplify this a little bit, could we not have the incidental catch um, sector sort of operate as it does now? It is um, evaluated post hoc um, right now. And so, uh, and then account for overages from the TAC in the following year without having a specific set aside or catch cap. Yeah, I mean, I certainly think that's a viable alternative. Mm -hmm. So, are you suggesting that we re replace what we have with that or add it in? I guess that would make it more complicated, but I, I wouldn't want to um, uh, say to replace all of these if other members of the board were interested in moving those forward as well. Also, okay. can you just maybe yeah. one more yeah. time reiterate what, what it is you're proposing? Because again, the, this catch accounting in the memo outlines that you, know, you either could, based on what the PDT has thought through, Catch cap that is a percentage of the TAC versus a set aside which comes off the TAC, and you're proposing what? So basically, that uh, the small scale fishery operates similar to the status quo that it does now, and then there's a post hoc evaluation of whether or not we've exceeded the TAC, and then the overage. From the tack exceedance caused by the incidental catch uh, fishery is comes off of the next year's tack. Just so I'm clear that, that that would mean that there's no no changes to the gear types that are outlined in Amendment Three. It would simply be the, the combined incidental catch small scale fishery gear types. If those landings Coastwide caused the tack to be exceeded, then that reduces the following year's tack. Is that what you're proposing? Yes. Okay. If, if there, if that's to the will of the board to have that as an alternative, then you know that can be included in the agenda. I would uh, like to hear from some of the proponents of, of keeping in Ketcher County in response to that, um, and even opponents, please. And Lynn followed by Max, and then Nicola. Well, go ahead, Lynn. And yeah, then thank you, Chair. So I think, I'm not sure, I fully understand what Allison was getting at, but I, I think looking at the memo, it seems because we know that the issue, you know, the trouble here is really with the the small scale directed gears, it seems to me like the compromise here is to keep three and four, um, options three and four in the document. Um, and I think option four might be what Allison was getting at where um, they have a 1% set aside, and if they go over it, it's deducted from next year's set aside. Um, so, so it, it takes out, it sort of, it parses out the place where the problem is and lets the, the little low volume non-directed gears continue running, um, as they are. So that would be my recommendation is to, is to keep three and four in. Um, and maybe not one and two. All right, we don't have those uh, presented, so that may 
you have to reference back to the memo to, to see what Lynn specifically is talking about. And that's sort of combined under this sub-option version of specific small-scale direct to gear types. So, um, okay, let's see. I had uh, Max next. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I am looking at the time, and I apologize because I feel like this is about to throw a wrench, uh, given what Lynn was just proposing. But I actually saw this being simplified the other way, keeping options one and two, which are um, rep, you know, somewhat simple concepts, in my opinion. Um, they're not gear specific. And then also adding Allison's proposal, what I, my understanding about Allison's proposal, which I, I think is a, a good option, is um, that it's not gear specific. The incidental catch provision would continue as it does. Um, you would just tally up whatever those landings are. And if it, if that plus directed landings exceeds the tack, you deduct it from next year's tack. I think that's another simple concept that we could add here. So um, I apologize, Lynn, but I think it, it would simplify things in my mind to get rid of three and four and add Allison's proposed option to, to one and two. All right. We're we almost seem to be at an impasse here. I'm afraid, Kirby, over this one. Um, we've obviously got divided opinions about leaving it in and certainly divided opinions about what to leave in. Um, so, uh, at this point, uh, hey, so I would maybe just uh, chime in. You know, I think Max's suggestion, uh, you know, from a staff standpoint, it makes sense. One of the concerns I, I do have about um, three and four specific by small scale directed gear types, you know, if, you, if those were removed, uh, you know, that that's easy enough to to count for. The incidental catch, you know, landings are submitted annually through compliance reports, and trying to parse out which ones would count and which ones wouldn't, I think, would get at this point a little complicated um, for the public. So, you know, Max's suggestion of just having three alternatives, um, the third being what Allison proposed of, of just the incidental catch landings being combined with um, all the other landings to evaluate the tack annually um, makes sense. And you know, we, we can include that in the addendum. All right. Well, I think uh, unless there is some adamant opposition to that course of action, that's what we'll do. And, and so we can move on, hopefully get to a, the, the last item in the report from the PDT. Uh, anybody can't go to sleep tonight because of that? So I, I um, have Joe Cimino and Eric Burgess with their hands up. All right, Joe. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry, but it's just, you know, being on the working group and trying to follow the PDT through some of this reasoning, it, it goes back to that decision tree. So right now we have an issue in New England where there's kind of a direct fishery in what used to be incidental catch, and that's what might put the tack in jeopardy. A uh, 1% set aside is a situation where maybe that covers it. Uh, with Allison's suggestion, we could come up in a situation where we, we, we reduce or eliminate fixed minimums and all of that goes back up towards New England and, and we have an issue that does make me uncomfortable. I'm not necessarily saying I can't sleep at night. <laughs> the things are getting so complex. I'm not sure if I can't sleep at night at this point. Well, I think that's the inherent problem with this. It's, it's become like sitting in a restaurant with a 17-page menu and trying to figure out what you're going to eat. Yeah, you, you, you almost get paralyzed and you start good at sitting there trying to decide what to eat. Um, 
Uh, but I think in the interest of moving forward again, you know, we're, we're going to see this again. Um, you know, Toby was just trying to help the PDT pair things down so that they can work most efficiently. But obviously, there's there's divided perspectives on this within the board, so I'm hesitant to to, to throw it out. And um, so Kirby can uh, is where we are. Um, We'll be okay in terms of keeping things moving forward on this addendum. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I hear Joe's concern. Like we've talked about before, when the board sees the draft addendum, if, if there's an interest in removing that alternative, then, then the board can do so at that point. All right. All right. Erica? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, with number two, as it's in the document and what Allison suggested, I would just encourage the PDT to include discussion of the potential pitfalls that come with a payback scenario, which is in both of these, for a portion of the fishery that's only accounted for at the end of the year. I'm not speaking in favor or against either number two or what Allison proposed, but just knowing what has happened in the Gulf of Mexico with this type of setup, um, all things with good intentions can have some unexpected and undesirable consequences. So just if that could be included in the discussion by the PDT in the next document, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Erica. And, and I'd say unintended consequences is the very nature of, of marine fisheries management these days. So, all right, Kirby, it is, 523. Uh, we've exceeded our allocated time. And, and Jeff, I'm sorry we had you queued up for uh, your presentation. I guess we'll hold that over to our next meeting. So we've got, I'd like to maybe if if we can dispense with the epi episodic events set aside, which is probably naive of me to think in the next few minutes, uh, unless folks really just want to have a hard stop. Is there anybody that thinks we just need to stop right now and leave this for the PDT? Anybody hang in for a while? Erica, is your hand up residual? Yeah, it was. Okay. No hands up. All right. Well, I'll tell you what. Those that can stay and those that have to go, great. Thank you for hanging in with us. But uh, Kirby, let's move ahead and see what we can get done. Or the EESA. -E okay, I'm just trying to get up on the screen real quick. Uh, latest version. There we go. Uh, in terms of statement of the problem. Okay, we got a problem statement here. Um, obviously, it's a it's a somewhat abbreviated version of what's in the, the memo, but it hits all pretty much most of the content of the paragraph that's in there. So anybody uh, have any recommended changes to, to this or uh, are we okay with it? I have no hands. Okay, so one more chance. It took you a few minutes to read it. Don't want to rush us. No hands. No hands. Nope. Okay. All right, Kirby, let's move on to the objectives. Or objective in this case. Changes in regional availability in order to minimize the increase in disruptions and reduce the need for chlorine transmission and spent arms. Okay. Any questions, concerns with this? No hands. All right. We're on a roll here, Kirby. Um, I think maybe it would be helpful, given some of the, the discussion on our last issue, is to maybe go to some of these key questions, which is, 
what the intent of the episodic set aside program is um, for the board's consideration, which is um, should it continue to serve as it has been as this kind of regional, uh, secondary regional quota? Um, should there be an alternative to remove the episodic set aside? And if there, if, you know, the other key question really is if there's interest in increasing the set aside, what should the maximum value be? Uh, where should that increase come from? And the PUT is considered, you know, either uh, off the top as a consideration, relinquish quota, uh, or through adjusting the fixed minimum. No, no changes to the initial set aside from the off the top, just from reductions in the fixed minimum. Okay, so we've got some questions posed uh, regarding the EESA, so I'll open it up for responses and comments. Chief Josemina? All right, go ahead, John. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess this is an issue of stamina at this point. I, I, I always ask those first two questions, but I don't think this is the time to address them. So I, I, I'm fine with, you know, not having consideration of alternatives to EESA at this point. Um, I don't, I don't know what a maximum value should be. Maybe that is something we, we, you know, put out there, you know, maybe the, the needs of, uh, of, uh, recent years that can help answer that. Uh, but I, I think where should the increase come from are all things that, that should kind of move forward in the document because I think those are all uh, reasonable places where if there is an increase. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Joe. All right. Anyone else? You have Megan Ware and Nicole Mazur. All right. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, in terms of the maximum value, I would be interested in something like 5% as the maximum value. And the reason I say that is if the only thing the board does to address some of the issues in New England is increase the topic, I think it would need to be that high to cover what the, the New England states are kind of collectively landing. So I would put that in there as the, as the maximum um, just for that reason. Um, in terms of where the increase should come from, I, I, I don't think it should come from number two relinquished quota, just for the simple reason that I don't actually think there's enough relinquished quota to be making a difference right now. And if we're potentially changing the fixed minimum in a tiered approach, I think maybe the states that are relinquishing quota won't be relinquishing as much. So to me, that doesn't seem to be really a solution. Um, I'm thinking one and three are actually a wash. And the, and the reason I'm saying that is if you, um, if we have a, a decrease in the amount of uh, quota that's tied up in the fixed minimum, so let's go say it goes from eight to 5% as an example, um, you, that 3%, if it's just reallocated among the states, most of that is gonna go to the states with the highest percentage of allocation. Similarly, if we, take a set aside off of the top that deducts the most from a state with the greatest proportion of allocation. So I actually think those two options will result in very similar numbers at the end. All right, thank you. All right, Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree on um, the 5% as a, a maximum value to be considered. Um, I'm because of the objective that we just reviewed, I don't think that an alternative to remove the set aside is appropriate to that objective and would suggest that we remove it. Um, and I, I agree that, well, I, I think that a initial set aside from the overall TAC is the most straightforward and um, transparent um, uh, way to, to increase this, the, the set aside. And, and as Megan said, not have it based on, you know, relinquish quota that would be variable from year to year potentially and, and much lower than um, the amount of quota that's been relinquished in recent years. Um, however, I did want to suggest that the addendum address um, allowing states to transfer their quota directly into the set aside um, because this is uh, 
essentially already taking place in years where there's been an overage of the set aside. Um, states have transferred quota to to cover that overage. So it'd just be um, nice to put that into the plan and make it clear that that, that could be done um, even before an overage occurred. All right, thanks. So we've got a recommendation to set the maximum value at 5%. Uh, we've got a recommendation that we delete number two um, and possibly number three uh, so that the uh, EESA is set uh, from the overall tax. Uh, and we've um, the recommendation that uh, we do not have an alternative to remove it. That is a useful tool in Menhaden management. Uh, and then the, the uh, recommendation that Nicola just made to account for existing practice. So, uh, further comments, recommendations. Anyone opposed to uh, the recommendations that uh, I just described that have been made by the previous speakers? I don't have any hands at this time. Yeah, I think, uh, I think everybody's just wore down. So, um, I know I'm starting to get a little hoarse myself. But, uh, um, one hand is with up, Tom Cody. All right, Tom, go ahead. I mean, I some I don't agree with some, but I'm also going that we're going out to public hearings with this, so we should get a lot of comments on how we public feels on this and so it's up to the recommendations when we finally get to go to public hearings. Okay. Thank you, Tom. Yeah, at this point we're certainly not <clears throat> to be binding ourselves to any final result. Uh, but we're trying to make sure that what we do take out to the public is understandable by the public and certainly understandable by us. So Kirby, uh have you got that? Yes, I've got I've got those um, down. Um, obviously, appreciate you summarizing. I'd say maybe just to help with simplifying, just one last set of things for consideration. You know, the plan development team recommended not including, you know, an adjustment to the date for um, distributing redistributing unused episodic set aside, uh, or consider additional restrictions on it. Um, and not allow jurisdictions to fish under the set aside prior to exhausting their state allocation. Um, so, you know, if there's board agreement with, with not to have those items in there, is again, that will just add more complexity to this document. I think we we should be in pretty good shape. The last thing that was was highlighted was just um, there there was interest in having the board clarify whether a state can apply for episodic set aside prior to fully landing their allocation. All right, thanks, Kirby. All right, some um, some feedback on on these. Uh, anyone um, opposed to uh, the deletions uh, recommended by the PDT as listed here? I'm not sure what their hands are for, but both uh, Nicola and Max raise their hands when you ask for feedback. So, and then you ask for opposition. So, give those two hands. Okay, go ahead, Nicola. Thank you again. Um, on that last bullet there, I'm interpreting it as a state um, having, you know, a projection that they're gonna um, utilize their quota you know, within three days time and at that time asking for to be able to access the episodic once they've closed their their state fishery, quota managed fishery. So I, I would I would encourage that to be a part of the plan so that that states can, you know, not have to wait for a something that they know is going to happen using all their quota to actually happen before being able to um, request access to the set aside. And um, I'd also like to request that the PDT um, continue to include, at least for the time being, an option that would allow jurisdictions to 
um, enter into the set aside before exhausting their state allocation. Um, and, and what I mean by that is say like 95% of quota use. Um, I think there's a lot of benefit to doing that because it would allow a state the ability to preserve a small percentage of their uh, state quota to use after the set aside is exhausted. Um, so that they are not reliant at that time on either a quota transfer or, or use of the incidental provision um, or having to close down, um, you know, small scale per se and activity, which is an option in, in the document. So I, I think there's a lot of benefit potentially to a minor tweak to the set aside provision. Um, and, uh, you know, I think that the PDT's concerns about the, the catch accounting is overstated. Um, in Massachusetts, we're able to, you know, account for those landings, whether in, in, in the right category, whether we close the fishery at 95% or 100% of the quota use. Thank you. All right, let me get this straight. So what, what you're proposing is uh, to uh, leave in that third bullet under the, the top, but to propose some modifications to the criteria for which it would be applicable. Is that correct? That's correct to, to include that, to continue to develop an option to address a slightly early entry into the set aside so that a state can preserve some of its quota for after the set aside is exhausted. Okay, all right, we have that Kirby. Yes, uh, it, it would be good to make sure we're, we've got a clear alternative in here as set at 95%, right? That's what I heard you say, Nicola. I, I would caution the board not to think about having too many alternatives of a percentage because that will start to get confusing and maybe have diminishing returns. Yeah, I think 95%, but I guess, you know, some reasonable range without, you know, getting too carried away would be useful. Um, okay, here, Max, I think you're next. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, this comment might be a little nuanced, but I was a little surprised to see the recommendation to not revisit the date unused uh, EESA quota is redistributed because it was my understanding that there are some administrative concerns with how that date is currently set and how redistribution happens within the same year. So it was, can you just, Kirby, if you don't mind, just elaborate a little bit more on to why the recommendation is to not include that? Um, I, I think I get that it definitely complicates things a little bit, but, um, concerned about keeping that, if we keep it the way it is, we still have those administrative challenges that will continue to occur. Yes, thanks. The, um, I mean, the thought process was from the PDT that the episodic set-aside program is, has been, if not fully utilized, close to fully utilized for uh, the last you know, few years, and, and that moving that unused uh, set-aside uh, redistribution date to sooner, um, there wouldn't necessarily be much benefit to it if we're talking about a very small percentage of landings. So that was the general thought process that, you know, including an alternative date without having a clear indication that there is a better date um, or Get a small amount of landings to be redistributed. Um, the PDT thought it wasn't as helpful to include, you know, multiple alternatives under that idea. You have a follow up on that, Max? Yeah, I, I guess that's a, an interesting perspective. I I was considering maybe a the potential option would be to not have a redistribution date, and I don't know where that would leave any remaining um, EESA in there. Um, you know, if there's any quota left, what would happen to that? If it would fold back into the pool next year, or or something. But I know that the date as it is 
poses challenges because states are still sort of counting for all the landings that have occurred and um, you know the commission staff is essentially doing the best they can to guess where landings are under the EESA at that point in time and uh, redistributing and so that number can change come final auditing. So I know there there are challenges there that have been addressed or been posed or, or raised. And um, I was just surprised to see no recommendation to revisit that date. So if the PDT feels that there's no reasonable alternative, then that's that's fine. I'm fine leaving it out, but I felt like I needed to at least bring it up. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, Mac. I, I, I think that, you know, I think they identify there's an issue, but they don't know how to, to mitigate the problem. Yeah, because since the situation is so dynamic, you know, and uh, you know, short of abolishing any date, and then that opens up another set of problems. So, uh, Tony, hands? No other hands. All right, Kirby, uh, you good to go on this? Yes, I am. Uh... Really appreciate the board working through this memo. Obviously, well beyond the meeting time. Um, feedback is helpful, and we'll continue developing this addendum. So, thanks all for for bearing with us on this today. Yeah, and I want to echo his thanks too. I know this this is uh, it's it's uh, it's fatiguing to try to pour through this and, and uh, reference back between you know a presentation and a paper document and. and you know, there's a lot of uncertainty about how these various elements relate to each other, and uh, I appreciate everybody's forbearance and uh, sticking with it. And uh, this will help uh, improve the efficiency of the PDT's activities. So at the next meeting, which presumably will be late January of 2022, then there'll be something to react to, and then there'll be another chance to, to hopefully perfect a uh, public information document that goes out. So. And Jeff, again, I apologize for, for having to bump you off the, the agenda, but uh, we certainly hope you'll hold that presentation uh, in the queue and we'll uh, hopefully get it uh, the next time we meet. So, uh, is there any other business to come before the Menhaden Management Board? Just no hands up. coming? But I don't see any hands. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any objection to adjournment of the Atlantic Midnight Management Board? I see no hands. All right, Kirby, you got everything you need? I think I've, I've gotten some support and some guidance, so I appreciate that. Thank you. All right, very good. All right, well, uh, thanks, everybody, and we will stand adjourned, uh, and the commission will meet again. First thing in the morning's executive committee. So, uh, everybody have a pleasant evening and thanks again for sticking with us. Thanks so much, Spud. Thanks, Kirby. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Good night, everyone. I'm ending the webinar now. Good night, Tina. Good night, Tina.